Uh, good morning, uh, Nick Strude, HR Director for Pennington County. What I'm here to do today to start is just discuss uh, the wage study um, presentation. We had, as you know, just before the public, we had our presentation from Conjuring Associates last week uh, where we just were presented the study. Uh, now I put together some more information and we're here to talk to you about some funding options. The, one of the keys I want to say this morning is I'm not going to be asking you to make a decision on the wage study today. I don't think that would be prudent because you, I just wanted to give you some information first on some potential costs of the wage study if it's something we want to implement. And as you go through your budgets <laughs> with, the, um, with the departments, then you can have this information first. So. Um, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing about the Condry study is you've had it, hopefully you've had a chance to read it over and digest it, but there's really two parts to this study. The first part is to bring our scale up to date. Okay, so that is what I've been referring to as the replacement cost. What does it cost Pennington County to replace a person and get a competent and get a, an efficient person in if someone were to leave? That's resetting our scale. That's getting our scale to where it needs to be to compete with the other uh, entities in our community. The second part is to apply the equity adjustment. And so the equity adjustment is a second piece that actually takes care of the people that are currently working for Pennington County. So you have the part with the scale, and then you have the part with the people. So I'll be going more into that, but I wanted to get that out first. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, this has been coming up over the last week and actually since the study started. Uh, there's some important issues that a wage study is not going to address. And it is not going to address our internal pay practices, our philosophies, how we pay people, how we give raises, how we apply COLA. A wage study from, an, from a contractor is never going to address all of those issues. So some of the examples that we've been talking about lately, some of the internal pay philosophies and practices that are outlined in our handbook that we're not going to address with either implementing a wage study or not is how we apply merit raises to our employees. We've had a lot of discussions about that from department heads on down. What is a merit? How should it be applied? Implementing a study like this or adopting what it recommends is not going to address that. There's been some talk about the discretion given to department heads when we bring people on. We're not, this study is not going to address that. And then there's some other things we've been dealing with like, should we give department heads more discretion to give their people raises while they're, while they're employed? And so those are some of the examples of things that we can't address with a study. Um, these are separate issues, which I hope we do address, but it's gonna have to be with you, the Board of Commissioners, the hum two human resource departments you have, the compensation committee, and then the department head and elected official group. So I'm not saying we, we don't want to talk about those, but whether we decide to implement a study or not is not going to fix those issues if we deem them to be a problem. So uh, a competitive scale, the first part of the Condry study. If you listen to me talk about employees, you're, you'll hear me say over and over, we're, our stated philosophy is to attract and retain the best talent. Okay, that's, we have that as our stated wage policy and a stated goal that we have, to attract and retain the best talent. So we have, to, we have to make sure when a person leaves for a local market, they're not doing it based on wages. We're gonna try our best to make sure that we pay competitively along with everything else that we do, which is called our total compensation package, to make sure that the employees feel valued, can pay their bills, and find this to be a place they want to come and give their talent to. Um, I threw a couple of bullet points in there on turnover. Everybody knows that turnover is costly. Some turnover can't be avoided. It's going to be a natural part of employing people. Some people are going to come in, some people are going to leave. But we want to make sure that our wage scale is appropriate to limit volunteer turnover in our local market. So when you have someone like Jess who's moving to Arizona, there's nothing we can do about that. That's going to happen. But what we want to avoid is someone performing a job, doing it well, looking across the street, seeing they can make a significant amount more money, and going and taking their talents over there. 
I threw in there a replacement of employees often 1.5 times the annual salary for a current competent employee once you add, once you, um, add in the direct cost, that's your advertisement, your recruiting, your background check, but more importantly, it's your indirect cost. That's the management time spent training, coworkers picking up the slack. We come into customer issues where they might not be able to handle certain things, so other people have to come over. And if you want a good example, you can always talk to our treasurer. She has a turnover where they're constantly training people because it takes so long to get trained, doing what they do in some of the sheriff's office positions as well. So when you train and train and train, and it's a lot of management time, it's a lot of coworker time, it's mentoring time, and then they get trained, and then they leave. Well, that's going to happen, but if we make sure that our wage scale is appropriately set, we can hopefully have those reasons not be wage related, okay? So, and then the last two things I wanna talk about, employees value a lot of things about a company. You know, believing in what we do, helping the public, the benefits, the retirement, days off, holidays, not, you know, not all of us have to work weekends, but none of those help pay an electrical bill. None of those are how people survive and pay house payments. That's your wages. So while we can't keep everyone here, even our most talented people, we can't always keep them here, making sure we have a competitive scale is one step we can do to ensure that we can keep that talent once we get it. Okay, the second piece is the equity adjustments. And in the department head meeting, there was some discussion about what an equity adjustment is. Okay, so equity is adjustment, they're called equity because they're applied equally to all employees to, to create separation from our current employees and our future employees. So it's applied equally to everyone in the same way when we granted COLA, cost of living adjustments, they're given to everybody. We don't pick and choose who gets a COLA. So these equity adjustments would be the same way. They would be applied to equally to everyone based on your data hire. What we're trying to avoid and what we're trying to alleviate with equity adjustments is what's called pay compression. And I don't wanna to get too bogged down into HR terms, but pay compression is when groups of employees are closely paid together regardless of their length or quality of service, depending on county. And so I've got an example on the next slide. But one thing an equity adjustment does not do and wouldn't be appropriate is pick and choose individual employees to reward. We would never want to ask an outside consultant to come in and pick and choose individual employees to reward based on some metric. So if we're going to look at an equity adjustment, it has to be to all employees based on their length of service. And so this is something that Deb and I went over last week and I thought kind of illustrates an example of pay compression and why if we were to implement this and give equity adjustments, uh, some of that pay compression can be avoided. So we have Jane here who's been working four years, currently making 16.33 an hour. Based on the new scale, she would be moved up to 16.35 an hour, which is the new starting wage for her grade. Okay, so she would get a two cent an hour raise. Well, Katie, on the other hand, has only been here two weeks. She starts at a lower grade than Jane, because Jane's been here for a few years, gotten her colas, gotten her merits, so she makes 15.93. Well, when that, if the salary survey was implemented, she would be moved to the same grade A, or step A, excuse me, making 16.35, the same as Jane. So she would get the 42 cent raise. What an equity adjustment would do would, based on her length of service, move her up two steps on the scale, so then she would be making 16.76 and create a space between her and Katie, who's only been here for two weeks. So that is an example of pay compression. So like I said, you can move, you can see that the equity adjustment moves our employees up the scale to create space between her and a person hired very recently. It's important to employee morale that their hard work, the time and effort that they've given to Pennington County is rewarded in comparison to a new employee who comes in years behind them. Okay, so why implement the Condry study, from my opinion? So wage Scales should be looked at every five to seven years to make sure they're adjusted properly to attract and retain the best talent. Again, I, I told you I'd say that a few times. It's been 12 years since our scale was last adjusted using a comparison method. 
The factor evaluation system, as Mark told you last week, has been used in public entities for over 40 years. It's constantly being retooled, redefined, but basically, as a breakdown, what it is is there's 10 factors that are looked at when comparing one job to another. Scope of responsibilities, time spent, physical demands, education requirements. Each factor has several levels and assigned a number of points. And when you look at the totality of a job, they, you add the points together, and then they're slotted into a grade on our new scale. So the grades are reflective of the factor evaluation system data, the completed salary surveys that were done by all our employees, the interviews that were done with over 50% of our employees, and a review of our organizational charts. And why that's important is some of the jobs came back and right in the, where they would normally recommend it might be too high for Pennington County because the people outside make more money. So they have to adjust that down to make sure it fits with some internal equity. So what I'm trying to get at, the first time in 12 years, if we were to implement this wage study, our, um, our pay scale can be reflective of data, comp statistics, comparisons, not just best guesses and strong personalities. Okay, so what has happened in the past, and this is natural, someone comes before a group like yours in the past and says, I want a new grade for my people and I think it should be a 20 because I think they're gonna work really hard. Or my people are only paid at a grade 18, but I know how hard they work, I wanna move them up to a 20. And if they have a really strong sales pitch, maybe they have a good relationship with this board, or they just have a very strong personality and can will their way to getting that done, then we move that up the scale. But that's not based on any data. It's not based on any numbers. It's just based on, you know, just being able to be a good salesman. So we've, we have hard data to show the decision-making process that we're going through, and we can get rid of those accusations of playing favorites or, well, obviously you got it, the commission likes you. Um, which has been said amongst the department heads in the past, not with this group because we haven't done that yet, but in the past it has. So if the commission didn't like you or you're not a very good salesman, maybe you wouldn't get your position moved up. But that's not really what we should be basing our decisions on. Hopefully we can base it on statistics, comparable data, and facts that we can show people how we arrive. Please. And along those lines, what, um, what if... Um there is a position in this study that is dropped down. Okay. And certainly, title-wise, I could understand that, given the factors and so on that you're talking about. But responsibility-wise, that position is very different in our county as opposed to outlying counties. So now already we're dropping this position down I, I mean, I'm curious how that is handled. Sure. Um, well, how it started was everybody had to do a salary survey. Mm -hmm. Every, we, we collected 680 salary surveys. Everybody did one. You had to write down. It was very labor intensive. You can ask anyone who filled one out. They were very long and you very detailed on what you did for your job. They took that information, and when they went and looked at other comparable organizations, they made sure based on what you provided with the salary survey and what the other position, what the other job description has, they were comparable. Now, will it always be apples to apples? No, and that's not the goal. There's never, there might not be 100% correlation between what you do for Pennington County and what someone does for Minnehaha County. Mm -hmm. The goal is to get within 80% of the comparable. That statistically will say that you do the same thing that they do. Now, if we're not happy, if you see a position you specifically don't agree with, we do have an appeal process. And we already have two or three appeals from the department heads that say, will you take a specific look at this? What that process is, is I'll work with Condry to give them a list of hopefully just a handful. We don't want to have too many appeals. And hopefully there's, I need valid reasons too, mm -hmm. not just I think my guy should be paid more money, because then we, we lose the statistical purpose of this, but there is an appeal process. We'll look specifically at that position. We'll re-look at the, the, salary, or the survey. We'll re-look at the comparisons made. We'll re-look at the hierarchy, the internal equity, and then we can make adjustments based on that. Okay. Um, but it's really important, and I want people to understand this. If anyone has a question, please come and talk to me. 
just because your position moved from a 23 to a 21 doesn't mean that there's going to be a large difference in how that position is paid. The old 23 was not based on a factor value, or it was based on an old 12-year-old factor evaluation system. You need to look at the band, the numbers that the position will actually be paid. <laughs> so people, some people really got tied up in the fact that I used, my guys used to be 18 and now they're 16s. Well, a couple things. You need to look at what they're actually being paid and there is a fact that they were improper, there could be a situation they were improperly paid, placed at an 18. A 16 is more, uh, is more in line with comparables and more in line with our internal equity. Some positions did get artificially inflated through, like I said, coming to old commissions and saying, this should be an 18. <clears throat> no, no real statistical backing, just I think that they work really hard and I think we should move it up. <laughs> so there is an appeal process, but at the same time, I hope that, um, I hope that department heads and elected officials and you can understand that while a person might be a very hard worker, you might have a great person in that position. For Pennington County, it is slotted on a grade based on their replacement cost. Where, how much is it going to cost us to go out and get someone that can competently and effectively do the job for us and for the citizens of Pennington County? We might have the best person in a position, maybe irreplaceable, but that doesn't mean that if we went out at the grade that's recommended, we could find a competent person that's able to do the job. So I hope that makes sense. I hope it, I answered It does question. make sense. I'm, I, I mean, but what that really leaves it open to is if you've got a person who is uh, pretty um, modest and, and when they fill it out, fill out that, that original questionnaire, then that, that, sets that whole position could be incorrectly. But, uh, and that, that could be, but we're also relying on Conjuring Associates who have 20 years, or most of them have more than 20 years of experience in public entities to see those, ish, to see those positions and where they should be graded. So a person could be very meek and say, uh, and not sell themselves, but that's the whole point. We don't, it's, it's not how well you sold yourself on a, on a survey. It, that's a one piece of it, understanding what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's also relying on the professionals that we paid a lot of money to use their expertise to help make those comparisons. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so. This is directly out of the wage study that you got last week. This is the implementation cost. There's plan A and plan B. Plan A, excuse me, <clears throat> is um, to be a market leader. If you read that, um, we could pay it 103% of the relevant labor market for comparable organizations, which would create some space between us and the other hiring entities in Pennington County and around our area, and then as they catch up with them, it would buy us a little more time on the back end. Mm -hmm. uh, plan B is to pay 100%. Now that's approximately 100% of the relative labor market for comparable organizations. Then what plan A and B do is have a four possible equity steps with the equity adjustment. Uh, the, Step one would be for one to three years of service. Step two would be four to six years to service. And step three would be seven years of service or more. Then you move down to plan A and B modified, which you'll notice that the classification changes are the same. A and B and then A and B modified, they're the same. It's just the equity adjustments are lowered. And that would be a one step increase for one to three years of service and a two year, or excuse me, a two step increase for employees with four years of service or more based on uh, June 30th, 2015. So we would just be lowering the equity adjustment a little bit. Now, just internally, the talking with Mark and with the department head group, it was decided that going forward, just based on numbers, I was going to present plan B modified as the most reasonable. Pennington County has always been a reasonable um, payer of their employees. We've not aim to be a market leader, but if you want me to come back and redo this with plan A modified or plan A, I'd happily do that. But going forward, just let you know I use the numbers for plan B modified. 
Why, why did you recommend plan B? Because we've always been a market matcher for our pay philosophy since I've started. We've never aimed to be a market leader in a pay philosophy. So I have to go based on what our philosophy, our current philosophy is. Again, like a few slides ago, if we wanna change our philosophy, I'm all for that. But in this presentation, I have to go with the current philosophy that we have, which is a market matcher compared to maybe the rat city of Rapid City who <coughs> aims to be a market leader. That's not our philosophy. So if we wanna change that philosophy, I'll happily give you the numbers with plan A. But using the current philosophy that we have as a market matcher for pay, I went with plan B modified. Thank you, Nick. Okay, so implementation costs. So this is, this is why I'm here this morning. Currently, the cost to implement the merit raises and the COLA in the 2016 budget that you have, the book that you have in front of you, <clears throat> is give or take $818,000. Why I say give or take is sometime between when that was submitted and January 1st, people are going to leave, people are going to come on, so that number is going to fluctuate very slightly. But 818,000 is how much is in that book in front of you for merit and COLA raises for 2016. Um, so the implementation cost for merit and COLA is 818,000. So I'm using that as my option one. You can say we're not interested in the Condry study. We, we don't want it. We'll go with merit and COLA like previously instructed and that's gonna be 818,000. So then you move into the, some of the different options that I put together. Now there's limitless options that we can do. We can implement half the classification changes. We can not do any equity adjustments. There's a lot of different, but just based on not having any feedback yet, because this is the first time this is being presented, I went with whole implementation options, okay? So there's, there's other ones that we can do, but these are whole implementation options. The implementation of the wage study results for plan B modified is calculated at $910,792, or $92,792 over the cost of Merit and COLA. Ron. The, I assume the Merit and COLA, the 818 was figured with Social Security and retirement, where your 910,000 is not figured with that. The 818 was based on the percentage of the total payroll, so we didn't include Social Security. So, but but we have to. I mean, when you say the total cost is nine hundred and ten thousand, not true. The total cost. The total wage that, cost. Yeah. Okay. okay. Plus plus benefit, Absolutely. plus Social Security, and plus retirement, thirteen and a half percent minimum. Sure. So I'm looking at the the cost of but, wages. But that's not included in the eight eighteen either. No. Okay. No. And again, if if that's some direction that you'd like to give to me, we have. You know, we have six weeks before um, provisional budgets due, so we can definitely refigure those calculations. I'm just looking at, and, and Ron has a really good point, these are just the wage costs. There is associated um, SDRS costs with this and Social Security costs. But uh, for the purpose of this, it's just the wage cost. Plan B is, or excuse me, option three, is to implement the results of the wage study while ensuring that all employees get at least the CPI adjustment of 1.5%. Now this would only apply to the employees who did not receive a 1.5% increase based on the results of the study. Now what the cost of living adjustment is, that is, in a, that is a blanket um, dollars that we give to our employees to keep up with inflation. The idea of a COLA is even if a person's wages stay the same, they would be adjusted in the amount of the CPI to at least have their dollar go as far as it did last year. So if you make $30,000 a year, we would move it up 1.5%. So that 30,000, what 30,000 bought in 2015 would be adjusted by 1.5% and could buy the same amount of goods and services in 2016. So that's what a COLA is. So there were some people that did not receive a 1.5% increase based on the implementation of the Condry study. So if we implemented the plan be modified and ensure that the current employees that we have employed right now in Pennington County were to receive at least the CPI adjustment of 1.5% to not fall behind inflation, it would be $930,778 of wages, and that was 112,778 
over the cost of Merit and Cola. And so I showed my math there at the bottom. And then we get into some higher cost implementations, such as option four. Um, this would be the implementation of the weight study if plan B modified while ensuring that managers have the option of awarding merit increases of 1.25% in 2016. Um, so you would, we would implement the wage study on January 1st, but we would still give managers and department heads and elected officials the option of awarding merit increases at a traditional awarding of 88% would cost us $1,009,358 or 191,358 over the cost of merit and cola. And then the final, um, the high dollar one, the one that we would give everything, this would be the implementation of the wage study while ensuring managers have the option of awarding merit increases of 1.25% at the traditional rate of 88% awarding and all employees receiving a 1.5% cola regardless of what the wage study said about their specific position. So even if someone, this would be different than option three in that we would only give, we would only give employees 1.5% who didn't already receive it, where in option five, the, the Cadillac plan, I guess we'll call it, that's everybody would get a 1.5% COLA regardless of how much their wage increased and we would give the department heads and the elected officials the option to award merit. And that would cost us 1029344 or 211344 over the cost of merit and COLA. And so I have just a couple more slides and then we'll dive into questions and we can go back and talk about the specific options. One of the things that this study does is yes, it will cost money to implement. Uh, we can't shy away from that. However, there are some future cost savings in this plan if we were to implement this wage study. And I was just talking with Sheriff Tome and I was trying to come up with a good analogy on sometimes you have to spend money to save some money. And I was thinking last night the best I could come up with was like insulating your house. You have a high energy bill, you put in some good insulation. Yes, it will cost you money, but hopefully it will save you money in the long run based on your lower energy costs. That was just one silly analogy I came up with. But there is some future cost savings if we did this. Many of our high turnover positions will, on our scale, were lowered. And that's important. There were a lot of positions that were lowered. And that will result in savings to Pennington County in a relatively short period of time. And I want to thank Steph. She was able to, Stephanie from the Sheriff's Office was able to put together some information which I wasn't able to um, just due to, I didn't have, I don't want to say I didn't have time. I didn't, she did this and I didn't, so I want to thank her for that. But there are 12 positions in the Sheriff's Office that were lowered, and I listed those. And those happen to be very high turnover positions. We can see a yearly savings of $47,195 in salary alone by turning those positions over once. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you at the end how we get arrived at that. But if you're paying someone $15 an hour, and then we lower that to $13 an hour, <laughs> you turn that position over twice, that's $2 an hour, or over the course of the year, $4,000 in savings from that position. Um, another example is, uh, we wanted to specifically outline this one, is a support technician. Unfortunately, it's a very difficult job, and we do have high turnover in that position. So it is one, we have 17 incumbents. This position is being loaded from a starting wage of 33,134 to a starting wage of 27,972, which is a savings of just over $5,000 per replacement. So if we turn those 17 positions over once, that's a savings of $87,754. So you add those two numbers together, that's over $130,000 in savings by turning those positions over one time. Now, I said before, we wanna to pay to attract and retain the best talent. But what we found is some positions, we were paying too much. So we had really good talent. We would open a job and we would have many applicants. But some of those were also high turnover positions. So we lower those. And so there can be a savings by implementing this plan. So in conclusion, and then I'll show you some math just so you don't think we made that up, but implementing the wage study will not solve all of our compensation issues. I don't wanna stand here and say, if you implement this, everything will be fine and we won't have to worry about wages ever again. That's not true. But 
for the first time in 12 years, it'll give us a scale based on statistical and comparison data, okay? Attracting and retaining the best talent and compensating our current employees to the best of our ability should be a continued goal. It's been a goal since I've started, and I still believe in that goal. We have 670 people plus that work here. They're dedicated, they're hardworking, they're good to the citizens of Pennington County. They believe in each other, they make great teams, and they deserve to be compensated as such. Okay, so before we get into questions, I just wanna show you how we came up with this. This is our data page, so you can look that over. And the old starting wage based on the new starting wage, the difference per employee, and the total. So. Um, with that, I will stand for any questions. Any Again, questions? I'm not, I, I wouldn't believe it'd be prudent to make any decision on this, but I want you to have this information up first as we go into budget hearings, because if you decide, they detangle themselves a little bit down the line, so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Morning, Kevin Tone, Pandy County Sheriff, and I appreciate the Commission's willingness to conduct the wage study, understanding there's no promises made on the front side, but at least you have the courage to do it and give us some guidance, I think, as we go forward. And Nick and Jessica did a lot of work on it, so thanks for your work with it. And I think it's a good foundation. I support it, and I agree with Commissioner Farabee's comments about as we get into the policy side of this, maybe some additional flexibility. And just one comment on cost of turnover. You know, if we hire a new deputy sheriff that isn't trained or certified already. It's eight months from the time we hire them until they hit the street. And there's a huge cost to turnover for us when you look at some positions within our organization. And Commissioner Buster, we're gonna pull some data for you to see um, where our people come from. Do they come from regionally when we recruit? Do they come from South Dakota? Do they come from out of state? Anecdotally, I can tell you a lot of them come from out of state. I don't know what the number is, but we'll pull that data and make it available to you so you can have that in front of you as well. Thank you, and, and what that tells me is we're very competitive, so I'm not sure we need to raise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, that's what uh, it tells me. I, so. I don't know. Anyway. Thank you, and I ask you to support the wage. Mr. Mr. Sheriff, I might I'll ask the sheriff the same question. As a, as a manager of your operation, <clears throat> uh, do, you, do you think you have sufficient flexibility? I, I'd echo the same comments Mark had and, and Nick's talked about, and try not to intertwine the wage study with policy too much, but I think there is some room for policy improvements. And again, we have a good mechanism with the Compensation Committee to bring those issues forward to the commission if we implement the wage study. So I, I would support that, yes. No, thank you. Okay. BJ Conover, Director, uh, Planning Department. I spent a lot more time up here, so I'm just gonna make this short and sweet. Um, basically, I support what's going on. Um, I wanna thank the commissioners for allowing the staff to look at this. Um, I do, would challenge you though, not to look at it as a cost, or as was stated earlier in the meeting, damage to the citizens, but more as an investment in the county, its employees, and vis-a-vis -vis then to the public. And also, uh, look at the current system, not uh, what it could be now as a liability for the future of the county, but change it and make it into an asset for the county. So we can get the county moving forward in the next five, ten years to where you want to be. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we've kind of covered things. Unless someone has a strong desire to say something further, we'll move on to your department, Nick. Perfect. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for showing up. I appreciate it. Um, thank you, staff. Uh, my budget narrative was laid out, and a lot of what I was here to talk about was handled yesterday. Um, Commissioner Fairby, you mentioned you had some questions. I don't know if those questions are still valid now that the motion's already been passed, but if you have those questions, I would certainly stand for those. Um, my uh, request for an additional FTE is reflective in a lot of the change that I'm asking for in my budget. Um, so because the first whole page of my memo talks about, first page and a half talks about my need for an additional FTE, which was already addressed, I can move on. Um, operations, uh, there's, there's two large, and, and I guess first I wanna say, when you look at my budget, you're gonna see a lot of large percentage changes. But I'd ask that you look at the, the dollar amount with associated with those changes. Um, so 
one of the big issues that I have is to update my office. Uh, since I started, I've been dealing with nothing but hand-me-downs. I've never purchased a new piece of equipment except for my laptop. Everything else has been given to me when it's too old to be used by someone else, which worked for a while. As, as you know, I was, in a, I was in a large closet behind Janet's office and she was, and I'm forever indebted for her for five years. She let me use her copy machine. She let me use her fax machine. She let me use her scanner. She let me use all of those things because she's a good person, but I don't have those options anymore. So I need things like a copier. I need uh, a second computer for a person that I haven't hired yet. So that's where you're going to see some increases in my minor equipment, um, my uh, copier maintenance, for example. So those are some incremental changes. I, it's not efficient when I'm meeting with an employee on FMLA to say, hold on real quick, I'm either gonna run over to emergency management, I'm gonna come all the way down to the commission to make a copy. It's, it's just not efficient. I used to just open my door and go use Janet's copier, which worked, but I don't have that option anymore. And I shouldn't, as an independent department, have to lean on using IT's scanner when I need it or copier. I, that's just my opinion. So uh, the largest increase that I have dollar-wise is an $8,800 request for additional contracts. And what the contracts is, is my training. Uh, $2,000 of that is going to be mandated for the next two years for my ADA training. Um, I have to put, we put on ADA training 2015, I have to do it in 16 and 17. Um, that's gonna be approximately $2,000 each of those years. Uh, this year it came in at $1,861. And that was uh, through a lot of cost savings with the city. And so I'm asking for $2,000 to address that. Um, also, I had Jessica do a lot of research, both within the department head group, the elected official group, and then I had her go out and do research on what training costs. <laughs> we can get effective training for our employees. Two, we need to do two-day training. Now, these are not two full days. These are options for two days because the way our department heads work is they don't want to shut down. Janet will never shut down her office to send all of her people to training. I don't think statutorily she can. But she can send half of her people one day and half of her people the other day and still maintain operations. And those are approximately $4,000 each. So we had plans and I will have plans with my new employee. We're going to do a lot of internal training. I call it the alphabet soup training. I can do that. FMLA training, workers comp training, FLSA, which is the Fair Labor Standards Act. I can do all of that. That's just presenting facts. I happen to think I can also give leadership training, but it is effective to bring someone in from the outside so they're not just listening to me the whole time because I have to work functionally with them. So if we need to bring someone in to talk about conflict resolution, maybe they have a conflict with me. So if we bring an expert in to do that training, then we can all learn the same lessons and hopefully become better employees. So that's the biggest dollar request. Um, you'll also see a $4,000 dollar request for the Native Sun News. I'm gonna take that over from Holly next year if it's still the opinion that we advertise with them weekly like we do this year. It was, it was directed by a motion of the board that we advertise with them. Um, so if that's your wish next year, it's gonna cost us $4,000. Um, supplies uh, went up a little. Uh, I left my travel the same. Uh, my phone and fax, I had to increase $100 because we were just, we were really tight last year. So, uh, operations request is an additional 55000 and I know it goes against what Julie asked, and I know it goes against, you know, the cuts we need to make. So, um, this is just my first draft. I didn't, when I submitted, I didn't realize we were $3 million over, but um, some of the things were already approved, and I'm going to need, uh, if I had to do cuts, I would look at my job recruitment, um, the not advertising in the Native Sun News and the Rapid City Journal, and then as much as it pains me, I would cut the training budget. Um, I'm really excited, and I'm going to and I'm going to advocate hard for the overall scheme of the budget. It's eight thousand eight hundred dollar increase to, for an like PJ said, it's an investment in our employees, 
if we attract and retain the if we attract the best talent we need to train them we need to make sure that they're giving the best service to our customers and you do that through training internal training and external training so um, that oh and uh, my salary request will obviously be lowered a little bit um, if we choose not to implement the wage study because the new person I bring on um, is going to be slightly, I imagine will be slightly less paid than Jessica. Um, hundreds of dollars less. So it's not going to be a large impact to the budget. So with that, I would definitely stand for any questions. Any questions for Nick? Get your cheapest, <clears throat> easiest department first. Start you off on the right track. You're talking about training, Nick, and uh, I just picked up little bits and pieces of this, what was it, ADA training or something where everybody had to go over to the Civic Center or somewhere. Oh. And uh, I got the impression that you've implemented something that can be done in-house Yes. that alleviates that mass yeah. whatever. Uh, yeah, correct. Uh, and Jessica's been great about it, so I'm going to have to learn how to do it on my own along with a hundred other things she does for me. But we've been putting trainings on in this room on off days so people who weren't able to go to the Civic Center can come in here and watch it on the screen that's behind you. Um, mm -hmm. And next year, what my plan is, is to possibly not combine with the city but maybe do something here. But the problem is um, we had over 200 of our employees go to that Civic Center day, and I don't have a room big enough where 200 people can sit in. Um, so we were able to share with the city because we were both going through this project, Civic Access, we, they picked up actually 66% of the bill and we picked up 33% of the bill for the training. That's where we got that $1,800. They paid for the room rental. I don't know, internally, Deb might have better off understanding how that works. They paid for the room rental and we paid for a third of the um, speaker. But it, it was a big, Big deal. I mean, there were, between the two days, there were 800 people there, so. My impression also was that uh, sitting there all day or however long it was, there were employees in the room to whom only maybe 15 minutes of it applied to them and their position as it related to servicing people and so on. And is moving it over here, does it hold the possibility of saying, you deal Dealing with the people this way, no. and you, yes. so, so you can modify that? Yes. We were, I don't, I don't want to say unimpressed. Um, what they offered worked for us the first year. We needed a large overview of what the ADA is, where it came from, why it was needed. Now, Commissioner Peterson, we're going to get into, I'm going to select a training, three-hour training, so that next year it only has to be three hours, which is still a lot, but it's less than this year. A three-hour training that talks about more of how to handle customers, more of the issues that you run into when you have ADA issues. So maybe if you did it by departments. We could. Um, logistically, um, I like <laughs> to put on, anybody can come at this time. We might have three or four training sessions to try to make it as. That way this fits and yeah, you save money that way. 70 people can come sentence. in here for time and we get um, Tony uh, Virtio over at the um, Sheriff's Department has been great. He's having training sessions for his, uh, for the Sheriff's Office employees and anyone who else wants, wants to show up. But once a week, they're setting aside some time. You can go over there and watch, and we're setting aside time here. But we learned some lessons, as always, and we'll be better next year than we were this year. This ADA has to be with a person presenter or audiovisual? Or... Um, this year, we, we had permission to videotape the person presenter. But next year, it could be a three-hour video we could watch. As long as we have three hours worth of ADA training, that was on our agreement. So if I can find, do some research and find an approved ADA training, maybe it's three separate one-hour videos, 
We have a lot of flexibility. I just have to make sure that every employee that has contact with the public has at least three hours of ADA training for 2016 and 2017, and then we'll be done. And to go with it, along with the chairman's uh, notion, you can tailor you can tailor that presentation to Absolutely. to the the audience. Absolutely, and okay. and we did not do that. It was more of an overview, no, general I, type training. So again, it was lessons learned. And we'll be better next year than we were this year. And can you put I heard it some on reports a... that it was not well. Uh, it was not a, not a good presentation. Everybody was sitting there sleeping or texting or, or whatever. That's... But couldn't you just have the departments have that video and do their own, you know? They did, yeah. Isn't that, doesn't that pass the requirement? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So you wouldn't have to take you know, your time to do that. Well, you the thing just... is, is, they're going to have to sometimes, somehow sit in a place and watch a three-hour video or listen right. to a three-hour speaker. Um, but they yes. have training rooms, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Well, as an example, the, the highway guys, a half hour, like, you know, like the chairman is suggesting, a, a short briefing for the you know, highway guys just to fill the square. But, uh, but three hours is... Okay. But didn't you say that we're required? Yes. To anyone have who has, anyone three. who has contact with the public has to have three hours of training in a year. And that can be three separate one-hour trainings. Um, it, one of the things, and, and this doesn't have anything to do with the budget, but training is important. ADA training is important. You know, we might not have had the best experience, but that doesn't mean it wasn't a worthwhile use of our time. Um, we, I did have a lot of complaints. Oh, this sucks. I had to sit there. And, but at the same time, the ADA is a worthwhile law, and we, even though we're being forced to do this by an agreement, doesn't make what we're learning any less valuable. But there were some grumblings. Anytime you make someone sit somewhere in one position that's used to out there moving around, they're gonna grumble. But I, I'm doing a, I wanna do a better job of understanding our employees and seeing if there's other options. And for example, if maybe three one-hour sessions spread out over the year might be a better option for our employees. You watch it in February, you watch something different in May, and you watch something different in September, so it's not as painful to sit down, but it's still, it's still worthwhile. It's still a good, the ADA is good, and learning about it and understanding how to help people with disabilities is worthwhile. We do have disabled citizens in Pennington County. I know it didn't go over great, but we'll be better. That's all I can promise. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question about travel. For, for yes. 4,000? Uh, yeah, that's, I left the travel and training for, that's for myself. Um, I attend conferences. Um, this year I've been to Brookings, been to Pier, and there's actually another one I'd like to go to again in Brookings. It's not the same training, but it just happens to be in Brookings. And so that pays for my um, gas, hotel, and training. And then whoever I bring on, I, I do believe in training. And so trying to be cost effective as possible, um, I'm going to make sure that they are trained as well. Do employees get mileage for coming to work every day? Okay, thank you. I just, I know for travel, but. The way, um, the way it's laid out is that you have to go somewhere that is out of the usual scope of your duties. If I had to go to Wall tomorrow, you would not pay me mileage. So do we get if paid you to, to come to work to? Go to Pier. No, if we, do we as um, commissioners get paid mileage coming to work? Mm -hmm. We live in Wall. Well, I think you need to focus on Nick's budget. We'll get to commission budget. In a commission minute. budget's next. But, <laughs> no, but um, I just no. As it okay. Yes, also, so do. I'll speak for employees. If I attend a training in Pier, you would pay me mileage. If I attend a training in Rapid City, no. Some employees don't, but commissioners do. I I'll only speak to my budget. I I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Thank you. Anything else you want to tell us? No, uh, if, if the mandate comes down that I have to cut, I outlined the two places that I plan on cutting. I would, I would ask that you look at the total dollar, not the percentage. The percentages look mean, but at the same time, I would guess that my $220,000 request for budget is probably a line item in other departments' budgets. So, Not to throw yeah. anyone else under the bus, but uh, I don't have a lot of operation expenses. And Mr. Chair, I, I might, uh, for my own edification, <clears throat> the sheriff has his own HR person? Yes. Correct. How does that interface with, uh, with our HR department? 
we work very well together. Um, there is a lot of duties that require full-time um, attention over in the sheriff's department, and a lot of them is recruiting. And, and it, if you if you want to come and talk to me about um, how that works, I'd gladly um, do. I don't know. I don't want to speak to anyone else's. I know Stephanie is very busy, and I know she does a good job for them over there. But um, Deb and I have had conversations about this. I don't under, I don't believe my budget hearing is probably a proper place to talk about what Stephanie does, or whoever replaces Stephanie. Um, but we work really well together, and I know she's very busy and competent in what she does. And he handles how many employees do you handle? Three hundred and fifty. And how many does she handle? Three hundred and fifty. That's why. Well, but see, my problem is either we have an HR department or, or we have two departments, and, and most organizations have one department for stuff. And, and that's my hang up. Yep. Uh, and, and, and I'll just, and, and this doesn't really, Jessica's going to a large county. It's called Maricopa County in Arizona. They have HR departments within each single function that are, there's one HR department for the whole county, but she's going to work just for the public defenders. And how many people are in the public defender's office? 300. So there's 300 people just in one department that she works in that have to follow the overall. There's one head though. Yes. Yeah. Thank yes, you. Absolutely. You, Sorry. you working for Joe or Pio or whatever? Wow, that should be exciting. Yeah, her and Sheriff he's, Joe. He's quite the sheriff in Maricopa. I always, when I go to saw my, or see my sister every year, Back in the day, that he was like the newsmaker every other day. <laughs> when I get picked up, I'm, at least I know who to call now. <laughs> <laughs> Public defender, you got an in down there. Don't for, or forget us. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the time this morning with the wage study. Like Mark and everyone said, at least we're having an option to entertain this. And um, give me any questions, and especially questions on my budget. I'll be happy to answer them. Thank Thanks. you very much. Have a good day. Yep, you too. Thanks. Okay. Where's commission? Whenever you're ready. Oh, let's see. I guess we can wait till Ron gets back. Bus crew had to go potty. We're a little ahead of schedule, so no worries. To, to, to kind of explain how we got through to really two HR departments, George, originally, um, Um, Sheriff Holloway felt a real need to have HR in his department, and we did not have one countywide, and there really wasn't a desire to have one countywide. So as he moved forward, especially given some of, of his different kinds of positions and different kinds of HR issues he had, he got permission to hire an HR director for just his department. And it's taken quite a while, I mean, um, to get to the fact that, that we needed one over here with the rest of the employees. And so as time moved on, we started out with contracting HR, then we had a part-time HR, and then we moved to full-time HR for the rest of the county. So that was kind of the history. At, at first, there wasn't a thought for many years that HR was even needed over here, but times have changed with laws and lawsuits and all kinds of things. And for us as a commission to handle that, that, I mean, that's pretty difficult. Or, I mean, you know how many things we handle. <laughs> but, uh, that, that was the history of it, and that's how it started a split. So. Oh, and, and, and I guess kind of where I, and I, and I appreciate that, I guess where I was kind of going with it, that that I have no problem with that person being located uh, where she is, and I guess it, it was Stephanie was the, the, okay. Uh, but Robbie should take guidance from the HR director and, and not the, the sheriff. I, I guess that's where I'm kind of going with. Yeah. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? So there's some consistent. I, I, I do. I just kind of want. Oh, oh, oh to I, fill I, you yeah, in. I understand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but, but Nick should be calling the shots. Yeah. You know, I guess is for HR. And I appreciate that too, George, because oh. I, yeah. I too had those concerns, and then I went and visited with the sheriff, and then I also visited with Nick, and then I also understand there's, what, 695 employees in Pennington County. Um, 
I wasn't opposed to bringing them together, but I wasn't opposed to leave them where they're at either. So, um, physical it, location has one thing, but but who's in charge is an, another matter. And, and anyway, thank you. No, I, I'm I'm listening to you, George. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. Yeah. Okay, commission budget um, starting at the top with salaries. Um, this, I've been here six years. Past boards have had a pattern of just raising their salary 50 bucks a month um, for the last how many years, but that's completely up to you guys on where you feel your compensation should be. Um, statutorily, you set that the first meeting of the year, but we obviously have to talk about it now to know what to put in the budgets. Um, I will still tell you again, you are one of the lowest paid commissions in the state. But again, that's that's a philosophy choice of, of you as the board. Um, so right now- For the I'm most what? Underpaid. And, and you have 50 bucks a month in there now? I did increase to 1350 a month for, for commissioners. Based on per population, per citizen that you guys serve, you are way underpaid. Again, so, compared so to other all, South Dakota County commissions. We're all entitled to be martyrs? <laughs> no, no. You are. I'm just You've been saying, here the for longest. the work that you guys put in, you guys put in a heck of a lot of work. But it's your decision. So, so it's what, in there at 1350 a month. So are other commissions paid mileage and um, benefits? Because I know the city isn't paid benefits or mileage. or They do get cell phone back when I was there, and they get... Back in the day, they got twelve fifty. Each so. county is different, Deb. They choose different things. Some counties do technology stipends. Um, some don't do benefits, health insurance, things like that. Um, we we offer you guys can take health insurance from Pennington. Um, I did send you guys out an email quite a while ago saying if you had any ideas for the budget, please let me know. There was one submitted for. Um, a technology stipend for you guys per month for your cell phones because I know you guys are using them a whole lot for county business. So I did put in there, um, I did some research on what other counties do. Um, the average is about 50 bucks a month for your cell phone. So I did put that in the budget as well. And that's in your utilities phone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So that would have to be a, a vote of the board if that's what you want to do. Um, and frankly, you can decide not to take it if you don't want to. Yeah, or you can put it in there and people don't have to take any of any, right. of, any of what we do, so. And Deb, to answer your travel question, um, commissioners have the choice if they wanna submit for travel or not. I've had past commissioners that don't take travel. Right. But again, it's allowed for any time you guys are going for a meeting, for to come here to pick up your packets, you can take that for mileage. That's your choice. Okay. And other commissions do that, or you, they, you don't know? In the counties? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep, they do. Other I appreciate that. Do. Yeah, but again, I personal just, choice. I, you don't well, have to I, take it if you don't want. But I'm not opposed to that. I just wanted to know what other counties do, and I knew what the city did, and they don't offer benefits, but they offered cell phone. And not that we have to copy anybody or worry about the city, but no, I'm just but referring just to what. just that, that past, based on past historical data, I did drop travel. Um, two thousand dollars because it just wasn't being used what it was um, and and I have to say uh, being in peer uh, on the board many counties the bigger counties they're going to Washington DC they're they going to NACO conferences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we don't spend anything on travel here I mean it just no, we, we, we don't. probably don't spend enough time doing that stuff but but there were way low yeah yeah, and we use it when we go to pier, you know, for spring conference and yeah, fall conference. And, yeah. Um, you know, Nancy and Ron can use it when they go to testify during legislative session. It's open. Personal personal choice. So, um, Excuse me, Holly. To, to me, it's not so much the, the travel. I, I have a real tough time for people just traveling here and there for conferences. They're just, just meetings that, you know, or boondoggles for the most part. But... But mileage, uh, and, and I highly encourage uh, the other four of you to when we have things on the planning and zoning uh, uh, calendar uh, that come to us, uh, I highly encourage you to go look at, this, look at the sites. And that, that involves some mileage. You know, uh, you know, it's, yeah. and, and it's just a must for me. I gotta go see stuff. 
I always do too, George. And you know, and, and I'm I'm sure Lindell goes. You you, you got to go out and look at some of that stuff, Lindell. And you know, I, I you can I can I can't look at pictures. I got to I got to go look at stuff on the ground. And I'm not opposed, George. I just gave yeah. you crap because oh, well because you kind of give us a little so. But I don't consider that travel. <laughs> I consider that part of the job is go look at, go look at job sites or go look at sites and. Well, and the other comment well, with with travel is I request that you at least submit it quarterly, so I. Or if you're not going to take it, just tell me, because every month I'm tying out your guys' budget, so I know at the end of the year I'm either going to get a $5,000 bill or a $2,000 bill for your travel. I'd rather have it quarterly so I know what's going on and have an estimate of where we're at. Right. I don't ever want to go over. Well, um, I just never heard of it, so, and I was just teasing George. I shouldn't say that word crap, but just teasing George in that sense, because um, some of his stuff that he does, but... Um, I just never heard of it. That's why. So it wasn't that I was against it. Okay. Um, so again, salaries. Um, you know, I surveyed everybody for insurance. Um, that went down. Um, people weren't taking what they were last year, so we had some reductions there. Um, for George and Dev, under professional services and fees. Um, we pay everything from the behavior management, our employee assistant programs. Out of that line item, we pay for our annual DLA audit. Um, out of that, that's running anywhere from twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a year. What's a DLA? Department of Legislative Audit. It's Thank set you. by statute. They come in and audit us every year. Thank you. Um, all of our dues come out of that. We belong to NACO, which is the National Association of Counties, um, South Dakota Association of Counties. Buckhills RCD, the Chambers of Commerce. Um, or do we still belong to the Chamber of Commerce? Not rapid, not this year. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't think they would let us in there. But. In. Actually, they would take us back. <laughs> they don't care. I already talked to them. Um, and then our attorney's <laughs> fees are in there if we have to go to outside counsel, um, Jackson Lewis or Gunderson Palmer, if we have any conflicts or anything like that, um, are in there. Um, publishing is always a wild card for us. Um, we pay for all of the bid notices, all the legals, um, liquor licenses. So operations went down this year for, for us. Well, I think for hiring another half-time person, you did a good job. Looks good to me. Thank you. Yep. It, and again, it was at a grade lower than what Jessica yep. was paid. Yeah. So that pretty inconsequential raise. So. And three thousand dollars overall. Yeah. And that postage machine was was a big chunk yeah, of it sure. that we bought for 2015. So. And Holly, thank you for your time on the customer service and working with Russ and Russ's concerns and the departments when I went to the department heads on. Um, what that means to have another person answering the phone and the customer service that that means to Pennington County. So um, thank you to the staff and you for um, working together because that means a whole lot, I think, to the, the citizens of Rapid City or us that haven't been here to know who to call or well, and we, ask the questions. Well, and we say we've only been in the building for a short while and we're still working through some oh, yeah. of those little things with our new phone systems and... It still takes your time and, things and, and the staff, and I appreciated the staff's comments that day, so. Yeah. Um, I guess the only <laughs> other thing that you guys had brought up earlier was having nighttime commission meetings. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't want to let that drop if you guys were still interested. There really isn't a significant cost. Most of the people that are attending them are salary or exempt people anyway. Um, there's a lot of other decisions I guess you guys would have to make in going along with having that. Um, the biggest cost would be um, security security and janitorial with changing their schedule and how they work and they would have to be later, snow removal, those kinds of concerns came up. But to be able to put an actual dollar amount on a meeting, I haven't been able to do that. Well, have you done it before and what was the turnout? From talking to other department heads that have been here a long time, Nobody comes. They come when you have a special nighttime meeting dedicated to a specific topic. Yeah. That's when they come. So we have more attendance during the day than we do at night, is what they're saying. That was my understanding, yes. It it's just was a concern when I was walking around to have night meetings. 
um, because of people's time. But you're also saying that maybe there needs to be a different change. Maybe we need planning and zoning at a different time because what's happening is most of our time we take is the first set and the second set of planning and zoning isn't very long or do something different there because we're having people wait Put it in till the 1 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and maybe just how that schedule is might be a whole lot of change that we need to make to make it better for the public. Yeah, I mean, that's something we can definitely talk about. I mean, yeah. Since you've been here and since I've been here, we've changed it three or four times. We have. And we've never found a, a way to, that, that it works, works good yet. So we it's go back hard. to the same thing we got. But we've tried it early in the meeting, late in the meeting. We tried 8 o'clock and it does, didn't work. Because you don't meet, you don't have to stay with the, the allotted times, you know, and that's... We're either That's pushing off planning or we're pushing off the other outside people. Yeah. Regardless what you do, you're going to push off somebody. But in my, when I've seen it, I've seen more people here for planning than I have for the other about that, and unless there's a specified mm -hmm. thing. So you can have it, I suppose, first thing off. Yeah, I, I mean that's a decision you guys can won't make. Have to if you want to put it on the agenda. But when's the last time it was this? It was changed from nine o'clock. A couple years, two or three years. Yeah, years, since I've years. been on it, we started at eight a couple, and it didn't work. When I first started, we thought we should start earlier. We had fewer people. They still were showing up nine thirty, ten o'clock for our. And then you had people. Never department tried night. Department heads are here. And well, now you got department heads sitting around early in the morning. And then you got department heads sitting around in the afternoon. You can never, <laughs> we could never do it. It never worked out. Right? But, but you never tried nighttime in, in, in recent recent years. Not since no, I've been here. Not nighttime. But we're, we're, I mean, now with the cameras in the room, department heads are sitting in their offices. They have the link that they can pull up the commission meeting, they can watch while they're working. Okay. So that that has helped tremendously. And maybe they'd um, be able to get their work done in the mornings when we had planning, so they don't have to be in here first thing at nine o'clock. Sure. Do you see what I'm saying? That might, I know just from doing my job, it was always easier to get my stuff done in the morning and then come in the afternoon. So it'd be convenient for them, and I think it'd be more of a convenience for the public. Maybe, like you said, you're never gonna really please the one half or the other, but what's it do for um, the overall picture? So you're thinking like have me the, the overall commission meeting start like at one o'clock in the afternoon? No, or? have the commission meeting start at nine, put planning and zoning first, and then do okay. um, the other people second. Or at one or one thirty at that have same then, day. And, and that's fine with me. But what you're gonna have then is the other people sitting. Yeah, I was to say, well, that's harder for no. me to schedule. But wait, maybe no you could what. do planning from 9 to 11 and then schedule, you know, a basic time that you knew at 1 o'clock, take your break, and then at 1 o'clock, because a lot of times we need a break anyway. We can't be consistent, though, because one planning item can take an hour, and I have no way to well, say, that, Joe. And that's why it's so important. At, at 1 or 1.30, yeah, you just, just take a break time. from our regular stuff yeah. and then have a it's almost like a separate day. You see, you do doing 9 to 11 or then, 9 to 12. Then you take a break for lunch or whatever, and then 1 o'clock. So people knew at 1 o'clock they could be here. And a lot of times oh, we so don't. So you'll be here all day. I mean, here, here's what I am I'm here past. all day anyway. I'm, well, you get to leave a little earlier than I do. But, but here's the thing. Um, that's what I have heard before is... It, it, it's a complete day, and people who run for office take that into consideration. That's a complete day, you know, and... I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. It's a public But, but day. other people might be, well, you know. If you guys want to talk about it, I can certainly put it on the agenda, or I can come up with some different ideas or mm -hmm. thoughts, get some feedback from the department heads, talk to planning. See it's it. a total waste of time to meet from 9 to 10.30 and then come back at 1. That's it. That makes no sense to me. Well, and I hear what you're saying, but think of all the people over all the years have sat here well, at 10.30 waiting, and, and, and that's tough on them. So would a, a solution be, oh, but then that's still hard to schedule folks from the yeah, community. It just doesn't work. 
but you could say, okay, no matter what, at 1030, we're going to start planning and zoning. But then what that does is if somebody's here to talk about um, a highway issue, then if we haven't reached that yet in our schedule, then they're going to sit through planning and zoning where they might have just had to sit another 15 minutes and get their issue taken care of. So, I mean, I guess the idea. simplest thing for me right idea. now would be we could change the advertising time for planning and zoning if we wanted to hit 1130. I mean, we could try that first. We did DJ? try that. Any ideas? <laughs> I didn't know you were going to talk about this. I heard, I it, didn't on, either. I heard it upstairs. <laughs> uh, PJ Conover, Planning Director. Um, I like the idea of possibly making it sooner. Um, I don't think there's been one time we hit the 1030 so far this I year. I think you're right. You mean later. Yeah. We, we hear a lot of complaints um, of the cost for surveyors or yeah. application agents to sit for hours in here. Um, I think it's pretty much a guarantee here? that you're going to have people that are by the hour being paid by the hour in this room for planning and zoning items, whereas highway, there might not be on every agenda. There could be, but I think you can More guarantee first, at planning and zoning you're going step. to have somebody here. So, um, the overall so we would be in favor of moving it earlier, mm -hmm. just for the fact, I mean, for, as far as staff goes, it's not gonna make a difference, but as far as for the public, moving it earlier would be ideal. And for our staff, I think it makes a difference. Just the concerns I've listened to that if we could do the planning and zoning in the, in the morning, they could get some of their work done too. So or, um, sorry. they come in in the morning. Yeah, I mean, or, they, they have operations to do and it's easier for them to do it in the afternoon um, than sit here all day as well. Or like what was mentioned at a certain time, you stop and start planning and zoning, whatever works best. So we'll do whatever the commission decides. Well, there's another alternative. I talked to, to another county, and, and they have specified times for each department head, and that's all you get. You know, it, right, right down the, the calendar, it, you know, 9-10, you're up, 9-20, you're up. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we should go there, but, but there's at least one county that does that. So I have to... Uh, We've got four more minutes to cover the budget, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then we have the next department up, the court. <laughs> At just, one o'clock. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're not talking budget right now. Yeah. Well, I, don't, I think you you two have to work together and put it whenever you want it, and we'll handle it when it's on the agenda. Mm -hmm. You want to go earlier? I mean, because you got to know so you can advertise. So mm -hmm. correct. Yep. And there has been instances, at least in the last four or five meetings, that people have been been here for an item and had to leave and they weren't able to be heard. And we got to remember the public, and, and I've, I've seen them mis mistreated. Seven to 9.15, uh, or 9.30. Thank you. Thank you. Because you might have to then move the auditor stuff, which is always 10.15, that's then gonna that's going to have to 10 move. times harder for me for scheduling to do that with consent calendar and getting the public. I mean, those people are public too, so. <laughs> that's why we... Weigh the difference. That's why we pay you the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Weigh the difference of who's affected. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, no. Quickly, Holly, would you share with us the license plate deal in terms of what what's going to happen? 2006 is when South Dakota residents last got new license plates. Um, the state has pushed it off and now is set 2016 to process license plates for um, new vehicles. Um, what that entails is the treasurer's office processes them, gets them ready, puts them in envelopes. They come down to the central mail room and we have to send them out. Um, we asked she, Janet um, Sailor Treasurer, estimated about 60% of the people got plates in 2006. That's going to equate to about 500 license plates a day coming out of the mail room. We're hoping it's going to be less. We estimated about 300 a day. Um, our new mail machine is amazing and kicks those license plates out really you fast. Can, you can run them through the machine? Yes, sir. Ooh, well. That's we, great. We've researched, we've looked at, at outsourcing to try and have somebody else do them. It's, it's going to cost us. 
they're going to cost us a handling piece per charge, handling charge per piece. Um, so we're still looking at options to see if maybe we can get an RSVP person or somebody to come in and volunteer. But in 2016, there's going to be at least two hours additional a day just sending out license plates. And that's on a normal day, not the end of the month when everybody comes in to get their plates. We could be doing a thousand a day. And some of that information commission is right in uh, the treasurer's report about mm -hmm. all this information yeah. so, that Holly's saying. Thank you for the new staff person. I certainly don't have two hours a day to go stay on the process mail. Having a full time person will help tremendously to be able to get that done. So, thank you. Okay. If you guys have any other questions, let me know on budget. Thanks. Thank you, Holly. You're up. One of you, both of you. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Jeff Davis, Circuit Judge. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Judge Craig Fifley, who will be the new presiding judge. Commissioner Farabee, Commissioner Troutman, Hi. Chairman Lindell Peterson, Good morning. Commissioner Hadcock, and Good morning. Commissioner Buscute. Good morning. I think you probably know most of them. In some fashion or another, I've run into it in some okay. occasions. Some. Longer ago than others. <laughs> Just a lot longer ago. <laughs> I've never seen you before, so I'm good. <laughs> well, just for your info, Craig just, and I just, I'm just Judge Fifley and I were in the same law class. At oh, the oh, yeah. That that's how old he is. I was going to say, <laughs> that's, gonna say that's how old you are. That's not right. You that's be exactly right, age. yeah. And I'm way older than both of them, so. <laughs> I'll let Judge Davis address you. Judge Fifley and I are still kind of working out how things best work and uh, between the two of us and since the budget was prepared under my leadership, uh, ask if I'd present it today. Um, it's contemplated that I'll remain kind of a liaison with the commission and uh, on the building project. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. No, you're not, Judge Davis. So that we get all that squared away. Um, if you're on our requested budget, there's a change that uh, came about as a result of uh, Auditor Pearson, who shows up conveniently, uh, <laughs> combining some witness fees in, in past years or a long time ago. Um, it was a joint witness fund that the court system, the state attorney, and the public defender's office all dipped into. And it proved troublesome uh, to the extent that nobody seemed to be watching the hen house, and it was easy for uh, public defender to request an expensive out-of-state witness to be flown in, and it just seemed to add up. So a good number of years ago, we broke those accounts up under each department. Um, I understand from talking to Julie that, that you folks are trying to kind of compress things and making the budget more meaningful. So her suggestion was that the witness account comes back under the court system, but is still being tabbed to separate departments. So even though it's it's a big increase to our requested budget. Uh -huh. We can break it down within that to the agency that's spending the money, either public defender, state's attorney, or circuit court. So that's, that's the disparity. Where we'd ask for 302, 234, it's now 393, 778. Okay. That 91544 um, is that difference. Wrong spot. You know, we don't have an updated yeah. one. Chris, no, I was going to say, I, I'm not seeing those numbers. Well, <laughs> we didn't get this in time to update it either. It came from Julie's um, submission to you on the, on the provisional budget. Okay. Copies of that, Holly? Well, we have. I don't it's, even have it. It's so item 15. Some. That's what I'm saying. Can you make copies of it? They have public defenders is the 31,000. Are they still under witness? Yeah, in because there's the 19.5. Where are we looking, you guys? Defender, and then combined okay. with, or I'm sorry, for the full 34.5 is in the public defender still, and then the state's attorney's in there too. Yeah, they both have. Can we just get a budgets. copy of that, Holly. Yes, mm -hmm. I will so get it straight. The 19.5 from the witness fees and the public defender got moved into your account. Right. And same with the state's attorney. Okay. And the 34. Okay. But on your budget summary, 
Yeah, is that what you're looking at? The well, bus, um, this the individual one is the one that wasn't moved. updated, but you I do have it in here. Over to here. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this is correct. They it was, still have to request it to make and sure the we get it in. state's attorney the same way right okay. here. But we have to report it in but financials that on one with sheet? the courts. So we're you will now that I know about it, and okay. we'll fix it, yeah. But those departments it. still have to request right. it. Right. But it's in the budget summary combined. combined. So it's yeah. correct. So they're individually mm -hmm. submitted on their sheets, and they are still responsible for them. each oh. department, not the courts. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Are they Deb, I'll get you a breakdown. Are they wanting new people? Is there any? You no, know? there's. This is for witness fees. J just witness fees, Commissioner. Okay. The the court system is responsible if uh, an expert witness it, it comes at a judge's request. So there isn't any different amounts. There's just a different way of doing business. It's summarized under court administration, which is where we have to report it for financials. Okay. But so that they are still responsible, they have their own witness number yeah. separate than what the court's witness budget is. Do they, do, does the courts even have witnesses? Yep. Yeah. So you got three different fields that your witnesses come from, and now they're all included in the budget summary page under court administration. And that's what he's saying is, is yes. the change. But the public defender has to support their own and spends their own budget, state's attorney does the same, and the courts do the same. Mm -hmm. Once we broke them out into those three individual responsibility fields, we got a good hold on how much we were spending. Okay. And it really s saved us some dollars. You itemized it a little better so you could so figure you it out. you will still always see each of those three requesting their individual responsibility. But it'll budgets, be under Mr. But Davis's. it's under the court administration summary on your budget tab. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm glad Julie was here to help explain that. <laughs> that's, that's a change that we weren't aware of either Thanks. until, yep, exactly. Thank you, Mr. Davis. So other than that, I'll stand for any other questions. Uh, it's usually a pretty short presentation. It, it speaks for itself. Uh, Commissioner Farabee and Commissioner Hedcock are, are new to this process with the court system. Um, we have no control, so to speak, over court-appointed counsel fees or for the ANNs, and that's why they're split out separate in our request, because you never know how many cases you're going to have. Uh, you know, a perfect example is the Croyle case was dismissed yesterday. Had that been tried, that would have been a very, very expensive case. Um, without commenting on whether it should be dismissed or not, that's the state's attorney's charging decision. But with that now gone, um, it's a significant money savings to the county. Thank you, Judge Davis, and everything you've done for the system, um, judicial system. And, and you've I'll done a lot. And I'll throw in my, my usual comment for, like, it really doesn't matter what they come down here and tell us, because <laughs> we're going to pay it. Yeah. No matter what it ends up being. We just, it, this is just a good way to kind of keep them in, in line, but, <laughs> but, uh, in line. <laughs> <laughs> He's saying traditionally, that. Uh, traditionally, I, go ahead. I listened to Ron in law school, and I'm still going to keep listening to him. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, they do they do a marvelous job as best they can up there. And, We're and kind uh, of it. traditionally, we've tried to be good stewards of the county's money, but there are a couple areas that are just absolutely beyond our control, depending on cases filed. The the other significant thing to mention to you, so that you are aware of it, um, once the public defender. Uh, discovered that um, they were overtaxed on cases. I did make copies of this. Thanks. Thank you, Judge Davis. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And I'll have this for you, Molly. Thank you. Um, as the th the three older commissioners will remember, and the two newer commissioners this year, uh, in 2013, midway through the year, when Eric Witcher took over the public defender's office, they started realizing their caseload was significantly impacting uh, the attorneys. Uh, the attorneys were way overcased. So a procedure was set up where Eric would try to maintain the toughest or the most expensive cases in his office and then withdraw from 
uh, more run-of-the-mill cases, and we'd appoint counsel outside counsel to fill that in. And I only bring it up because in 2013, there were 260 of them that went outside, oh. and I had to come back for a budget supplement. In 2014, there were 354, and it's kind of coincidental, but the number seems to equate to about $1,000 uh, a case because we ended up with about a 350-some thousand supplement last year to uh, mm -hmm. cover those expenses that weren't budgeted for and, and that we can't anticipate. And in 2015 so far, uh, 50, 70, there have been about 100. So it's conceivable uh, at the end of this budget cycle, uh, someone will be back uh, to try to cover those additional court-appointed council costs. So is it cheaper to hire or hire out? Exactly. And, and in this your isn't, experience. This isn't throwing Eric under the bus. I mean, it's just, it's a fact of life in Pennington County. We go right. through a lot of court-appointed counsel. Um, he has staffed up significantly, and the numbers are going down, as you can see from the chart. Um, I know that, that Mr. Vargo was requesting some additional help, and I'd speak on behalf of both of them. I mean, you've got excellent offices in both the public defender and the state's attorney's office. For a long time, they were, in my opinion, understaffed. Mm -hmm. And uh, you either hire or hire out. So the increases uh, that you folks have granted to them, I, I think, are, are very worthwhile. Okay. Could you share with us the uh, <clears throat> criteria for deciding whether or not a defendant gets a public defender or not? <laughs> No, <laughs> and I say that kind of laughing, uh, Commissioner, because there is not a hard and fast criteria around the state. Years and years ago, we tried to have a little checklist uh, and looked at uh, all the family factors. We do still have an application for, port for court appointed counsel where they fill it out, yep. assets, liabilities, and it's a balancing act that the judge goes through. Uh, you kind of look at the severity of the case, uh, those sorts of things and make that determination. Mm -hmm. The defense bar, you have uh, Randy Conley on the uh, Public Defender's Advisory Council who does a pretty good job advocating along with John Murphy for uh, scrutiny of those court-appointed applications. Um, Randy could tell you stories about past clients of his that uh, no way would deserve a public defender and if, if the judges aren't watching, um, those things will creep in. We do, there, try to, we do try to monitor it as closely as we can. Are there any numbers available that would show us uh, the differences between circuits? I'm not sure other than, uh, I'm not sure that individual circuits keep track like we do on the 7th. I can tell you in Custer, Fall River, and Shannon, or well, Lakota now, but I'm not sure that that the other counties across the state track it that way. The UJS tracks it in total, but doesn't break it down. It'd be interesting to see whether there's a philosophy or not that varies from circuit to circuit. I, I can tell you from experience that there is, even just right here within our circuit. No. There's so many socioeconomic factors that, sure. that come into play. Thanks, Judge. Okay, any other questions for Judge Davis? Speaking of, of, uh, of defense, the, the Dakota legal, whatever it is, that uh, where does their line item show up on our budget? They're a subsidy, George. They're an outside subsidy that we pay an annual contract to. They're, you'll hear that from them on Friday. Dakota Plains Legal Services. And, and, and you, you folks appoint them? Yes. Okay. It's, it's kind of a tiered system, Commissioner. Um, first fallback is the Public Defender's Office, and then they'll often conflict out uh, if you've got two or three defendants huh. or they've had a person before that they can't represent. Then the next fallback is Dakota Plains, okay. and then from there we go outside to outside okay. counsel at $91 an hour, soon to be. Okay. Thank you. And Even, even court-appointed counsel fees aren't ordinarily what most attorneys charge. But it's still expensive, terribly expensive. Any other questions? Thank you. Are we off the hook? 
So we're charging Great. you more. Thank you, of what thank you Judge on. Davis, Judge <laughs> Reifley. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to get introduced to you folks. Thank you for what thank you do. You. Appreciate it. Man. See ya. Okay. Next is fire. Lindsay, don't do that. <laughs> we had to catch up. Now we're two minutes ahead. <laughs> well, we can. We can. Take a two-minute break. Sure. No, I'm going to. You can post it when you want to. Take two minutes. All right. I'm going to go potty, too. Excuse me, Holly. On Title three, I, do you feel comfortable enough between old and new? I've got some questions that I... Um... And, and, and it really has to do with, you know, last year we were told we didn't have any old, and now we do. I have a very detailed, long email from Julie okay. where Scott and Denny and Julie and everybody was going through the Title III funds. They did like a mini audit on it. Let me get that to you. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and maybe that'll answer some of your questions. It very well could, because, um, you know, I just, um, I know he's asking for some of that, and I just thought, well, last year we said we didn't have any old to give out, and now this year we do, but I know we haven't had an influx. I mean, they aren't paying Yeah, you're the not old. getting any new. Um, yeah, let me get that for you, Nancy. I don't... Okay, that probably will help my question. I need a so. copy of it here. It's so confusing to have two programs, and they're so completely different. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's just not right. I still don't know why they can't just go back to the way it was, because the new title, three, don't really get spent, and then it just goes back into the black hole in D.C. So. We've got to be out of money in one of them, don't we? Well, the old is what has been spent down. Yeah. See, Title II goes Hi. back if it's not okay, thanks, any Spike. sustainment. Title three, we could keep and continue. Yeah. So. yeah, let me find that for you. I'll go get that here. I'm sure I still have it. Okay. He's on his way down. Thanks. Any do? Thousand dollars a minute for every minute you're late. Let's see. One, two, three. Okay. <laughs> My watch has ten forty five. Well, you oh. get fifteen thousand extra. Damn, he got you. <laughs> Sorry about I thought it was at eleven thirty. Okay, you're on. <laughs> Proceed. Okay. <laughs> Proceed. Talk, talk about the changes. Denny in your Gordon, budget. Payne County Fire Coordinator. Tell us about the changes in your budget. Um, let me just look at the budget sheet that we submitted. Try and pick out a. There's one I'll explain in just a second, but let me try and pick out some of the others. Um. Not sure which budget, if you have the request where it shows 2014 expended, 2015 approved, and 2016 requested. Yep. Um, you go down to line 422, which is professional services. Well, that shows like an increase of 11,200. What we started doing is doing all the wildland, or the, excuse me, the structural firefighter training, we're contracting that out, uh, paying the instructors to, to do that. In the past, uh, the instructors around the county just did that on their own time. And we said, that's not really fair. So the fire service board said, we'll pay them, I believe it's $25 an hour for their instruction time. Um, and not all of them charge. Some of them still do it free gratis, but it's only fair. That way we can help control that. We're going to guarantee we're going to put on that firefighter structural training class every year 
in January through about May, uh, which has been real haphazard in the past. So that's most of all that increase. And it was made up in other line items. If you look down a couple line items in supplies, 426, <coughs> that went down $7,800. So, you know, we're doing that within our budget. Um, let me just, if you look down at line 492, uh, capital assets, infrastructure, land, that's $25,000. That's an that's an estimate. Uh, we're trying to purchase the KELO tower, which is south and west of Wall. KELO TV has, um, doesn't want that. We've been on that tower for 25 years, and they were, have no use for it. They have no equipment in it anymore. Um, we have our paging for our east and uh, and a radio repeater on that tower, it's very critical for us. They're gonna get rid of the tower. They're gonna dismantle it, tear it down, do whatever, they don't want it. So we've been in negotiations with them for actually kind of almost two years. We pitched it to them a year and a half or so ago. Their management didn't know what to do. They just said, we'll think about it. Um, then here just well, about three months ago, I got an email from uh, Paul Myrick from KELO, their head engineer. He says, are you guys still interested? I said, you bet we are. It's critical for us. So we're like literally at step one of probably 100 steps. Um, he's taken it to the KELO management. They haven't decided whether or not they'll sell it exactly, and if so, how much? So I'm You're estimating. thinking 25 grand will buy it? We're hoping. I've asked several yeah. people what it's worth, you. you know, that are in that business, and they say 15 to 25,000. So the thing we have, I hate to say too much, I mean, you know, I don't mean we're in secret negotiations by any means, but it would cost them as much to, to tear it down. I mean, yeah. You know, it cost them probably $15,000 to tear, have someone come and dismantle it. So we sort of have a bargaining chip, I guess, with them. And anyway, so that's but that's twenty five thousand. Um, when we get a little farther, actually, about I think well, almost two years ago, I'd come to the commission and ask permission to pursue it, and you had the commission at that time had said yes, but we're not any worse. Uh, and obviously, we'll have state's attorney involved and. You know, if we do purchase it and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, um, so that's that amount. Um, vehicles, 35,000. Uh, replacement of the 2003 Tahoe. Estimate 35,000. They're about 33, 32, 33,000 on state bid. And then a couple thousand dollars for to reinstall radios, um, light bars, lights, et cetera, a few of those little little things like that. So the uh, Tahoe has about 112,000 miles on it, I think, right now. Um, okay, the big item, if there's no questions on any of those, the big item in the jump in uh, salaries of $52,965 is, I anticipate, retiring next year sometime, don't know exactly when, and then that, uh, let me tell you how much. 49,742. Uh, 49,742, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, 49,742,49,000 is the buyout for my unused sick leave and unused annual leave, so estimating the annual leave at this time, but um, I estimate, let me look, 300 hours of annual leave and 2,200 hours of sick leave. I use about one day of sick leave a year. And so that's the big item. Other than that, I have just plugged in the COLA and MERIT and for this position 
and then the Cola and Merit for Carol's or the staff assistant of which we, we share that 4060 with emergency management. And, and you've got Condry proposal. What what is that all that? That well is that the extra if we that, that's if we not do it? figured in here into okay. this amount. Uh, after I sat down or with Condry or on the conference call, it's about twenty two hundred dollars for this position more, which we could absorb in the budget. Just move some numbers around. That's just you or both of you? You and That's Carol. just me, this, this position. Carol's, um, when I went in and talked with Nick about it, uh, hers was overall total, I mean, separate between where she's at and where she should be, was only like around $700, $800, and then we split that 40, 60. So it's literally a few hundred dollars. Excuse me. Uh, Denny, how um, how much time are you going to give us to hire a replacement if you're going to? Um, hire? Several months. Okay. Um, I have in my head. I have a plan on how I'd like to. And I'm going to say I would allow between sixty and seventy-five days. Um, me, my thought is, we, of course, we you know we do the advertising and stuff, get the applications back. Uh, have a committee of, I'll call it five, and this this may change, you know, um, committee of five who would review, we get it down to like 15 applications. I have no idea how many applications we get. Get it down to like 15 applications to review. Those, that committee of five would review all 15 of those. Let them pick, you know, um, who they feel top one to number 15. Then take that down to maybe five, six, seven, to do actual interviews, uh, the same committee of five, so that they're familiar with those people from kind of from step one all the way through. Um, not rushing the interviews. Sometimes, you know, it's like, oh, we got to get somebody on board, so we got to, you know, we're going to do interviews this week, and we're going to hire them next week, and I don't want to see that in this position. I think it's too important in the county. So does, we take our time and do it right. Can, can emergency managing management do is what you're doing, Denny, without no. having to hire? Tell us why. No. Or tell me why. How about that? Too many duties. Too many things going on. You, what's your position compared to his? Equal. Meaning for job duty. Does, I mean, what does I, he do compared to you that that he couldn't do? Or that, that emergency management department couldn't take over your um, job? Not yours personally, but if we didn't uh, hire again. There's just not enough time in the day. Okay. I mean, when you're working with the 20 volunteer departments, you do the planning and zoning reviews. You do the um, attend the fire meetings that are specifically for fire. Um, stuff like this rainbow, Black Hills Fire Advisory Board, um, all those meetings and stuff. One person can't do all that plus all the EM duties. I appreciate that because that's something I heard that you know maybe position isn't needed or there wasn't a there wasn't you know once you retired and stuff. So it's nice to know and be straight up with um, what is being said and what um, is the difference. And I already met with you, so I know, but I just wanted to be um, straight up with the commission. These are the things that maybe some people think that emergency management can be taken over and Denny's job can be. Um, you know, you know you can, sucked in yeah. with the other, but um, I, I think with the new job uh, here oh, six months ago or so, the fire service board uh, completely reviewed the job description. I don't say they totally rewrote it, made it very clear, very specific, very detailed, and there's just no way that one person can do those two jobs. It's, it's just impossible. Thank you, Danny. If you do, then one or the other is going to suffer tremendously. It won't get done. Mm -hmm. So, I appreciate that. Thank you. Have you, uh, you you described what you thought might be a process? In my mind, uh, <laughs> all of this should flow through HR. Oh, absolutely, yes. And uh, have you and Nick 
talked about this at all? Um, lightly. I mean, other than just the fact that I plan on retiring sometime in 2016. Um, and that's about as far as we've gone. We're not close to um, the job description was we wrote with with uh, with Nick, I'll say, kind of having the final say. He did the final review, I guess, uh, looked at it, said looked good to him. Didn't He had a few minor, you know, verbal changes to it. Um, but no, absolutely, that when that day comes, he'll be an important part of it. I would like to see one of the county commissioners uh, sit on that, we'll call it that interview panel, um, because the fire coordinator, fire administrator works for you. So yeah, I think the reason I ask that is in, in some of the other situations, uh, highway in particular, uh, Nick managed the whole the whole deal, the committee and the interviews, and and I assume had a big hand in screening the applicants and that sort of thing. Oh, absolutely. The, you know, the the I'll call it the announcement and stuff would definitely go through through Nick's office and and generally the way we've done it in fire and and actually in the EM because we work closely together. But is that you know we get all the app all hundred plus applications, look through them. You know, because you always you still want to kind of know. And then we've whittled those down. But absolutely, and I think Nick would be an important one to have, or whoever is in the HR department, uh, would be an important one on to be on that interview panel, too. Because nowadays, you just have to be absolutely sure you don't ask the wrong question as much as you do asking the right questions. Well, I know <clears throat> one of the things that uh, has been done in some cases, and, uh, and I've from a casual observer standpoint, I favor getting psychological profiles on applicants that are at least the finalists. And uh, certainly, some of those things uh, HR has oh. dealt with. Yep. I, I'm totally I, wide open to anything. I mean, yeah. but again, that was just my my first thoughts as to kind of how to who would be a good panel and, and just kind of how to do that, and, and then have about a when you say thirty days, that sounds like a long time of overlap, but it's really only probably twenty working days. Right. You know, four weeks it's for a new person to come in, shadow, take over, start seeing what's going on. Um, and that could kind of depend on who gets picked. Someone who's very familiar with, with county fire, then it becomes an issue of just learning the county policies and procedures and things. If they're not that familiar, then they gotta go out and learn both parts. So. Okay, any other budget questions? I have one, Mr. Chair. The, uh, on your questionnaire, you've got uh, self-contained breathing apparatus, 40,000. Where does that get reflected in your uh, budget request? It's under minor equipment. Um, that pro well probably be under a, a capital assets. That's a grant that we're going to apply for through FEMA. And we haven't even the grant application period hasn't even opened up yet. So um, maybe we're already halfway through 2015. We'll be lucky. It'll probably open up around September, October. Wouldn't hear until sometime in 2016 at best. Uh, some funding will come from the fire departments, just like we did when we purchased the 12 fire trucks, uh, oh gosh, a dozen years ago. Um, there'll be a cost share in there somewhere. What, the 40,000 you think is under 499 and not uh, 426? Well, no, it's. The forty thousand is under four thirty-five. It's just that what he's because you're applying for the grant this year, but you might not get it paid till next year. Oh yeah, you have no. It's so I almost hate to say it, but a typical federal grant. See. You can apply one day, and you may not. You might hear in thirty days. You might not hear in a year. So, um, now you talk, I'm sorry, Commissioner, are you talking the 2015 or the 2016 budget? I'm just trying like, to... 2016. Okay. You're long term, but, yep. but you don't know when that's going to 
this. You don't have it in there. No. No, I don't have it in there. I, I just, I have no idea when that might happen. They may not even open it. We don't know. Yeah. And if they don't open it, you don't spend it. Nope. Well, that was my next question. If do, do departments need to upgrade, I've, I, I've heard a little bit about the condition of the, some of the units need to be upgraded, I guess is what I've, what I've been hearing. Some of? Yes, the self-contained self breathing apparatus, what we wear, uh, has a shelf life. Um, and after about 10 years, um, they are no longer, they do not meet any standards then. So then everybody has a large liability. Uh, the new ones coming out are much safer for the firefighter, lighter, more comfortable. If we all go together, we're talking 350 of the SCBAs. Pricing becomes huge then, discounts. And I think we stand a very good chance getting the grant uh, just because we put in for what's called a regional. In other words, all of Pennington County puts in under one name. So, uh, and some of the departments, their SCBAs are 15 years old. And they're quite honestly, they're, they're a firefighter hazard. I mean, they're a, it's a safety issue for them. So. So your total capital costs? For 2016, they're going to be 65,000. Um, we don't know. 165, did you say? Or? 65. Yes, we're anticipating 65,000 for 2016. That's without the SCBAs. They don't put the grant award in their budgets. No. Right. Because they come in for a, right. a supplement once the funding is received. Right. We did that with the city, yeah, too. That's why it's not in there. You don't no, want to levy I, for no, it. No, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. No, <laughs> I thought maybe that's, why that's why I said, you were seeing That's why I said where you're only 65000 And there's no new projects in the works that you can anticipate that will come in 26 or no more new people, no more FTEs. No. Okay. Thank you, Denny. But, but grants aside, we, we do need to do some be, be doing some replacing, and, and the individual fire departments are probably going to have to foot that bill. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to have to foot the bill. They will. We'll probably use a. I'll call it a combination of funding, like we did with the twelve trucks that we bought twelve years ago. Is that um, if it's approved, and if the guidelines don't change between now and whenever they come out with the new ones. Uh, it's a 90-10 it's a cost share, 90% FEMA, 10% local. And then how we make up that 10%, we'll work that out with the fire departments. But what we're talking on a $5,000 air pack is what about they cost between five and $5,500, is that then that department share might only be $500 for one unit. I'm not going to say all of them can afford that. A lot of them can budget for that and absorb that cost. So where do we see in the budget? Is it is it in the front pages where the grant where different what departments are getting grants or dips money or any kind of different money in uh, their budgets? We we never see that unless it Typically just comes don't. through here. Why? Because you just don't know. You don't know. Departments have to come to you guys and get permission to apply for the grants. Well, we approve them. So then you see them when they come through commission. But they're never put in the budgets, grants and other STIP money. Well, that stuff, that's all in your revenue. You're talking when you get two different the grants, things. You, we will amend the budget to put the money in there so they can spend it. Right. But you can't right now because he doesn't know if he's going to get any money or not. Well, I'm saying that is because it has affected FTEs and different in the future. Well, and if I know or people know that this might be coming down the tra coming down the road, isn't that a big piece of budgets? It comes to you on a commission. Agenda. And if I knew you had a grant for it and now you're carrying these people over from a grant and we start noticing that when people are getting grants like we did in the city, those grants and those people... We are very specific when they come in with grants. We talk about FTEs. Yeah, but how did you know that the FTEs that they were asking for weren't for that? That they just carried them over and... They, they can't include them. The, the FTEs that they asked for, I, I mean, they, if they're... 
I mean, the grant part of it is separate. We're not, if you put grant monies in here. You don't put them in there. You put them as a separate line item. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Because when you're figuring out a budget, if I see that Denny has 316,000, I'm just guessing, for fire trucks and grants and from grants and, and different money, I don't know what you call them, I'm gonna say stip money, they ain't stip money, but you see what I mean, Title threes, then um, that's huge for me seeing on his budget, maybe, you know, what's happening um, in his department. But we have so very few of those, Deb. There's some in the state's attorney's office. So there's Title three grants, there's stip money, there's... Um, there's hundreds of them. You yeah. couldn't even... I, we I couldn't even go over all of them. We don't track any of that. We just apply for them, we ask for them, and then we're done. Track them. There's, we there's we have to track them for auditing purposes, you know. Um, I'm saying in the budget, Nancy, I understand we, we got it but, down. But this budget is what we're basing our, our taxation figures on, and, and you don't want to tax somebody on a... a I didn't say put it... You're not understanding. I'm not saying put that money in there. You don't get the money. You, you, you don't put it in there because taxpayers don't... That's not part of our total budget. What I'm saying is when we did FTEs and we did different projects... It was nice to know, like police departments always told us they were getting grants for three others and they were getting three grant FTs and they were getting two um, budgeted items FTs. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And here's what, here's what our philosophy is. If you're going to hire somebody for, when you get a grant, you're going to hire somebody. When the grant is gone, they're gone. Mm -hmm. We well, don't keep... Yeah. Well, it's funny because then... the city keeps them. I mean, now they they just were getting five no, or seven new cops. No, what I've seen here them. is they call it a different program. They put it <coughs> in, a, in a program, and then they hire those people through that program because that's a program they did, and and it's successful now. We need. Do you see what I'm saying? How you tracked it is in 2014 they had three people on a grant, two people that they had on FTEs, and later on, you're we saying we do that. You're I saying that you've seen that the county has done that? No. I'm saying how do you track it? If that's, how would you know it was happening in here if you didn't know I on grants what FTEs yeah. were? Some grants are ongoing. I mean, you're pretty well assured you're going to get a grant every year. And I, I think the state's attorney always has a victim's assistance. They have a victim's I mean, there's a few of those. Yeah. And I, I, I can only assume that they pretty well know they're going to get $100,000. I don't know what. Right. Every year. And they do probably build that into their budget, into their revenues. But like this particular grant we're talking about is, have no idea. No, I mean, but I'm not saying your grant in general. I'm saying what I've seen yeah. is and, and there's other how FTEs are built here. in planning departments and um, different programs sure. through grants. And, and sometimes you don't even know there's a, a grant out there and all of a sudden you get a letter in the mail halfway through the year. It says, here's a new program. You can apply for it. Uh, you know. Mr. Chair, back to safety. Are, are, uh, do we have a concern with any of the volunteer fire departments going out there without proper self-contained breathing apparatus? We need to upgrade them. Hell, yes, we do. I mean, are they all operational? Okay. Yes, they are. are they, it's, uh, uh, We're on the edge, but not over. We're on the edge. Okay, and, then, and, and they're going to have to replace them. We stand a better chance of getting that regional grant then I'll say that fire department does maybe on an individual basis because they, they give a higher priority to a region. I understand, but at some point in time, we're going to have to, with or without help, we're going to have to, to do it, Yes. the volunteer fire departments. And one other quick question, line 426, 107,000 minor equipment. Minor, that's kind of, kind of major to me, but what is 107,000? Uh, total operations is 107,000. All, all of operations that's, okay, is 107. That's the minor equipment, then that's okay, zero. All right. Good, good enough. Thank you. Yep. Tell you what it's Okay, we've got a couple more minutes. Uh, any more budget questions for Denny? I almost hate to, if I may, I no. almost hate to bring it up, but I did put in for some Title Three <laughs> funds for next year. It's a long, long story. If you want to hear the whole thing, stop in my office or call me and I'll come down and and you know, fill you in, but we have some Title III funds left over from previous years, and we hadn't asked for them for the past two years, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and so the funds are there. That way we can help reimburse these fire departments when they go out and they do 
work on the Black Hills National Forest up in the hills. So then you tell me what exactly those funds are used. Can you buy vehicles? Can you buy new equipment? There, there's two funds. There's what we call old funds, and they have a different set of restrictions or guidelines. And there's what we call, generally referred to as new Title III funds, and they are much more restrictive on new Title III funds. I think it's in the budget under old Title III funds, and I believe there's about 28 thousand I don't have the number but right can you front. buy vehicles can you fund vehicles and stuff with that your equipment on the old funds we could pay for training okay we could pay for uh, search and rescue operations don't think of that as Pennington County search and rescue but it's search and rescue right um, we can buy some equipment thank you we could buy some training materials under the new title three funds about all you can spend it for is search and rescue operations, and it has to be pretty well spent in a fire-wise community. Thank you. So back to what I was saying, back on Title III funds, we could have been paying some capital costs that maybe we could have got through Title III, but if we had known that, maybe we could have helped the new at that time with Denny and worked together to put those together and uh, get some of that equipment and save the taxpayers dollars. Um, but we didn't know that. We just knew because we wrote a paper, not because it was on this paper. So we have to go to Denny to make sure we know his grants or his funding um, on some of this stuff that we could get help pay, getting paid through through different funding sources. Title you know. three funds, uh, Title three, old Title three. Yes. We had committed all those funds, again, a couple of years ago to the Mountain Pine Beetle Project. Right. We thought we had them all spent, and then Scott Guffey, in his uh, financial wizardry, <laughs> nice. ended up not spending it all. <laughs> so there was some left. I mean, that's good. Well, I'm not saying you did that. No. I'm not saying your department did that. No. I'm saying that's how that works sometimes yep. when you're talking about grants and funding, that some of that stuff... You can't do it now because there's new, you know, specifications. But other departments, they can do that as well through grants and funding. And, and that could title, save taxpayers dollars and not have to take it out of some of what um, title we're putting in our funding. Title three funding budget. Uh, a year and a half ago was totally up in the air. It looked like that program was going to go away. Uh, we weren't counting on those funds and all that sort of stuff. So we we kind of didn't budget for it. But anyway. No, but that's the very short story of a very and you, long. And history. you've done it right. So. And I'm not saying that. I'm saying no. in general that these things um, could help. And now I'm going to have to give you my lecture. Go ahead. When you say we could do that stuff to save taxpayer funds, guess whose money the grants are? The federal government, you see, doesn't have any money. <laughs> right. It's our money. But where those pots come from and how that saves on our budget might make a difference. Have you said that before? What? Have you made that statement before about taxpayer funds? I have. Oh, thank you. <laughs> T Title III funds will come from stumpage, I think is the term. Yeah. It's yes, got. I mean, so it's from, from logging sales. Yes. I mean, yes. so in kind of a sense, it really comes from the contract. So why aren't but we getting any this year? Anyway, sorry? Why aren't we getting any? Just no logging going on? Or? No, we are. But it's just the restrictions are so tight, we can't use it. That's why we talked to our Congress representatives to hold yeah. those restrictions so we Remember we did some letters on that a couple of years ago and so on trying to... Well, this year it came to us, but I think um, Mr. Buskins, because I read what, on it. Yeah, and what Pennington County gets for Title sick. III funds <laughs> is a drop in the bucket. Some of the, like, Washington and Oregon, some of those mm -hmm. counties out there get millions. We get 30-some thousand, 38,000 in Title III, roughly. I mean... It's a drop, but you know, for some states, it's a it's a major. Again, ten years ago, we were getting seventy five, eighty thousand, or almost a hundred thousand in Title III, but not anymore. So anyway, specifications changed. Thank you, Denny. Okay, thank you, Denny. Okay, thank you. We're ready for Scott the Wizard. The Wizard. <laughs> he doesn't have a hat. Should we get him a hat? Good morning. Good morning. Scott Guffey, Pennington County Weed and Pest Director. Uh, which one do you want to start with? You We've just, got Weed uh, and Pest first okay. in the book. Weed and Pest first. Yep. Um, 
you can see uh, there's total bottom line on the grand total of the budget is about $10,000 increase I'm requesting. Uh, majority of that's in, uh, in uh, salaries. Um, I did make a little bit of cut in operations. I mean, there was a little bit increase total net. And then uh, I don't have the vehicle replacement last year. We had an ATV replacement in the budget this year. I'm not asking for any vehicles replacement to, to offset that. And I did bump up my uh, revenue by 3,500 to help offset some of that increase too. So um, you can see an increase in health insurance. Um, if you look at what, what I did this year was um, back in fall of 2014, summer of 2014, we bumped three of our seasonals up to full-time benefited because be between the weed and pest spraying and the mountain pine beetle, they're getting you know 11 hours, 11 months basically paid on seasonal. So we had to bump them up to FTV, FTE to be benefited. Um, so I split it six months, uh, weed and pest six months, uh, mountain pine beetle on those <coughs> three seasonal now full-time. And uh, the, we recently had a change over in one of those positions and previously the three guys weren't asking for health insurance. The new guy, he's a younger guy. Uh, he doesn't have a spouse that has insurance or anything. So he took the insurance. So there was a bump there in the insurance as well. So no new FTEs? No new FTEs. Capital costs? No. Okay. I mean, like I said, I don't have vehicle replacement this year. Um, you know, if you do see weed and pest grants, not to stir up the hornet's nest again on the grants, <laughs> but uh, the, you, weed and pest, the Weed and Pest Commission every year gives out, <laughs> I call them uh, subsidy grants, for lack of a better word, and I've argued with the commission on that. But uh, if the county meets certain criteria as far as atten attending trainings, the, the annual conference, um, there's a few other things, your, your annual reports you have to get in, right off the bat you get anywhere from five to six thousand dollars they'll just give that to the county and that'll help cost share with your chemical control or your seasonal seasonal uh, labor help uh, so every year we can basically count on that so do you put in your chemical control do you put that in your budget um how much the chemicals is that under supplies yeah i mean with all my revenue i mean it just kind of offsets my my budget so if I didn't get that grant, or if we didn't get some of the contracts, weed spring contracts, then you'd see it reflected in my budget that year. I wouldn't hire as many seasonals. I wouldn't hire buy as much chemical. It would just be offsetted. So right. So it just helps offset the cost right. for this budget. Correct. Thank you, Scott. You bet. Um, on mountain pine beetle, uh, you can see I did bump up. Uh, the salaries, like I said, w this is the first year that we're kind of fully implementing that those FTV, those three FTEs. And uh, in the past, we've had the state grant. And then in 15, w that was this current year, that's offset by that state grant as well. Um, I did offset that on the professional services and fees with the idea those three seasonal um, now full-time guys can do, uh, we got them chainsaw certified so they can do some of that work now. As we progress into our shaded fuel break project, um, they can do a lot of that work that, that's, that could be contracted out. We can do that in-house now to save some of that cost. Um, and and they're, uh, they're also trained up on um, if, if we need help on doing a surplus sale or a salvage sale that's full of pine beetle and the Forest Service needs help, we got those guys trained up to do a timber sale uh, marking now, um, and they they obviously are knowledgeable in the pine beetle marking and all that. So um, that's where the offset was. So it was only a six thousand dollar increase when figure out the salaries. So I tried to offset that on my uh, operations with the salary there. And then uh, the last budget predatory control. That's uh, that's a two to one match. Um, the state game fishing parks matches the county's dollars two to one. And that basically pays for the state trapper for the county. So if a rancher has a problem with uh, a coyote, coyote issue, they can call the state trapper in and take care of that issue. 
Um, it's just basically kind of a pass-through voucher through my department, and that's based on the livestock census that they redo every five years. So this will be stable for a couple more years. It's not a huge budget, but that's where that money goes. Thanks, Scott. And then uh, I guess um, long-range planning. Uh, you know, we, we, we have 10 vehicles. Um, we try to run those approximately 10 years, and then uh, it's probably time to start looking at replacements on that. We're going to start having to start recycling a few of those here coming up. So I, I kind of projected out kind of a, a plan on that. Um, also, last few years, I've been kind of putting the bug in that it, we could uh, use a cold storage facility to park the, those vehicles under. You know, you look at that, we probably have $150,000 worth of vehicles sitting out there all year long, uh, exposed to the elements. If, you know, a cold storage facility, we're looking at approximately $30,000 $30, to build that. It's nothing fancy. Uh, could be a gravel floor, electricity, and garage doors, um, just to park those vehicles under uh, to keep them out of the element, elements. So that's, uh, that's on my wish list, I guess, sooner or later. Have you, Scott, have you talked to Building and Grounds about that? A little bit. Um, Recently? I, I, I emailed Mike um, when I was putting this together to get a, a cost, okay. approximate cost, but uh, I, I'm sure he's been busy, and I ended up getting one from Clary, and that's, that's approximately what it costs. So. Okay. And they might be able to do it cheaper. I don't well, know. Maybe they, some of that stuff they could do in-house. I don't know. And I was just thinking that they're looking at all that planning out there for mm -hmm. the new building yeah, for maybe highway. Lump, and it just... Lump that in on the bid or something. Kind of makes sense mm -hmm. since there's already contractors out yeah. there and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Scott? Thanks, Scott. Must I answer them all? <laughs> your, your weed board meeting starts in a little while, right? Yep. <laughs> so I got to race back and get to that. I'm, I may or may not get there. Okay. <laughs> I kind of figured. Yeah, I'll do it. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, Scott. You. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Okay, we're. Wonder if PJ can come down. A little ahead of ourselves. No, up. She's got this phone right there. Thanks, Gordon. <laughs> hey, can you come down here? Okay, bye. No, this is not fun. I'm bad at spelling. I know. I'm every time I ask a question. I know. Anyway, that wasn't gone. It's cool. it different around. Assuming something. Yeah, I'm getting punch. tired of it. That's what's so crazy. Assume I'm doing something wrong. Say it. Hey, just abbreviate everything. Deb, I'm not assuming you're yes, doing you are. anything wrong. Yes, Don't you are. Don't jump down my throat when I'm no, just trying to ask you, you a question. You say the same thing. I'm not jumping down your throat. You ask me the question back like I do stuff wrong or I'm saying something. Do you think we do that at Pennington County? It was I'm, a simple question that I so asked was you. So and was why mine, are you getting Holly. so excited and jumping down things? Jumping down. It's a question. We are here then to ask questions. Then mine was a question, too. Yours, it's not a question. It was assuming something. That's how when you, you took it. <laughs> no, that's how you say most of the stuff, Holly, when you say something back. Do you think I'm doing something wrong if I don't give you this? or If, yeah, I, if I think you're doing something wrong, I'm going to say it to your face. Well, that's good. What say I want it right you at a commission understand. meeting like you're, you're the same. That's fine, Holly. Yeah, but we've never done employees in Pennington County before. We've never tracked them before. Good for you, Holly. You're in charge. Oh, my God. This is ridiculous that a commissioner is going to act like that and treat their staff like that. Wow. Well, I'll have to say the same, Holly. And it's not just me.
self-contained breathing apparatuses are five thousand bucks a piece. So self-contained what? Breathing apparatus for the firefighters. Uh, they showed them the other. Yeah, that's a lot of money. At the last meeting, and one of the things that's good about what they're starting to do, they're going to try to get like a fifteen-year lifespan out of them and have replaceable parts, so that. And, and they can upgrade the mornings and, and, and basic apparatus a long time. That that's a good idea. Oh yeah, it's uh, the safety. We just get a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Get a lot of trouble. You know, like, like, like the drunk guy that. Oh, wasn't that so sad? Just early. Yes, yeah. we're ready for you. And I agree with him. There's no policy. I do have some, uh, uh, PJ Conover, Director of Planning Department, I do have some improved budget sheets for you. Thank you, PJ. Thank you. Thank you. The number on that budget sheet is not going to match the memo that was written uh, prior to that being submitted. Essentially, um, what, we're, what we did with the planning budget is we did the numbers that you're seeing reflect the ordinance budget and the planning de uh, department budget. During conversations with the auditor's department, it was determined that the ordinance department, as it was labeled, did not need its own budget and is not its own department. So the decision was made to consolidate that budget into planning. So the numbers that you're seeing on the sheet that was handed out from the 2014 actuals, 2015 approved, and 2016 requested, per Julie's recommendation, reflect both budgets for those three years. Overall, as you see in the bottom right-hand corner, with the consolidation, the loss of long-term employees, so through salary savings, um, we're requesting a budget that's $7,000 less than previous and uh, about 1.5% less. What you'll notice under uh, 422 is the $20,000 that we're asking for to, as a portion of the monies to get started on getting a comprehensive plan put together. There's another $30,000 that is budgeted for an overlay district, which is under the water budget, and Brittany will talk about that um, after I'm done here when she's presenting her budget. So together, that if they get the $50,000 for next year, it would be a good start for us to be able to have the comprehensive plan looked at, the, the ordinance, floodplain, pretty much everything that we need to... Uh, hopefully stop a lot of the variances and a lot of the other permits that applicants are coming in for and spending money on. Um, the primary discussions have been with Clarion, the company that was basically chosen by the last planning director after vetting a few other companies, and they had basically a really good, they were the only ones that submitted a nice comprehensive report and phased th uh, through the comprehensive plan about five or six different phases over the course of a year and a half. If we were to get the, the, this $20,000 to get started, plus be able to use the $30,000 that was um, allocated for the overlay district, which is gonna be part of the comprehensive plan anyway, um, that would be able to get us about halfway through a comprehensive plan. And according to that one company, not the one that we're gonna go with, but according to that company which we have information from, that in itself would take a year. And then after that, it could be anywhere between six and eight more months <clears throat> to finish the rest of the comprehensive plan. And at that time, we would be requesting more money and we'd have a more accurate idea of what we would need to finish it off. <clears throat> Overall, if you remember, last year, the director asked for $172,000 total. <clears throat> that money was, that included Clarion's work um, on the comprehensive plan plus extra staff time to work on the comprehensive plan. And that's where some of the savings were coming in and it was still $172,000. So instead of us asking for the commission to bite off that much all at once, we're looking to phase it with $30,000 already been allocated for an overlay district and then an additional 20 to get things going. Um, that's pretty much the highlights of what we have. Uh, again, all the numbers reflect uh, the two consolidations of the budget budgets. One thing I'd like to point out uh, before I'm finish is item 427 for miscellaneous travel, the $7,500. Again, that's $1,500 from ordinance and $6,000 from the planning budget. Um, primarily what needs to be taken care of this year is uh, 
staff needs to get certified as uh, floodplain managers through FEMA for the county. Our current floodplain manager will not be renewing his floodplain certification in January. Therefore, it's uh, pivotable, pivotable, pivotable that we get that done. And so we're looking at doing myself and Brittany as the water coordinator because then you'll have a primary and you'll also have a, an alternate and a backup in case one of us is out of the office. Uh, that alone with travel and the tests could be about half of that $7,500. Where do you have to go for that, PJ? There are some that are close, but they're happening. There's some in Wyoming. They're all over the country, essentially. The one that we're looking at is actually in Pennsylvania, and I'll tell you why. There are meetings that are coming up soon, in, uh, this month, next month, in August, which for our staff and the volume of work we're doing is not going to work out for us. Plus, we don't interpret FEMA regulations right now. That's still Wes's job. We interpret our ordinance, and then when we have questions, we go to West. So we, need, we still need training on that. And a lot of the conferences and trainings that are coming up are one day of training and then one day for the test. And talking with other FEMA representatives around the country, they recommended a four-week training, and then there's a review on the Friday. So it's Monday through Thursday training, review on Friday, and then the test on Friday afternoon. They said for people that are new to that, that is the best way to go, considering the tests, tests are about $500 a piece, so you want to make sure you get, them, get it right. So given the options that we had, that one in November was, our, was the most comprehensive and the biggest bang for the buck. What questions do you have for me? So if I understand, I maybe missed something. I, you've got $30,000 in some reserve somewhere? Now you're going to put another 20000 in that reserve, so in a year or two you can do the comprehensive plan. Yes. And there was $30,000 budgeted last year for the overlay district, and we had formed a small committee. Um, it was Karen, myself, and Commissioner Peterson, and we had talked about the overlay district and how to move forward with it, and it came to the conclusion it just came full circle into the comprehensive plan. Okay. It really didn't make a whole lot of sense to do the overlay district before the comprehensive plan, because then the overlay district would just have to change based on information from You're the comprehensive. You're just trying to, to ease into, into this so we don't have shell shock Absolutely. $170,000. Oh, you read into that, did you? <laughs> Absolutely. And it doesn't mean it would start January 1st of the new budget year. Uh, the co conversations I've had, again, with the one company that we have the most information from, is that you want to make it a continuous process. So if it has to start in July or August of that year to be able to carry through so there's no long breaks in the times that they're here for the public meetings, which are a considerable amount of time, then when they're meeting with you and making presentations as they go through, just like they did with the city, um, they just recommend that it not start right away and there, there not be any long breaks because then people lose interest. Yeah. Yeah. And again, Clarion may or may not be the company we go with. It's just the one we have the most information <coughs> from to use as an example. Any other questions for PJ on their budget? <clears throat> Brittany, did you have more? Yes. Brittany Molitor, Water Protection Coordinator. I just wanted to go over the water protection budget. Uh, the biggest changes is, again, that 30000 that was under contracts. Um, that was allocated last year for the overlay district that we're looking at rolling into a reserve um, this year. Um, the other um, notable thing on the uh, budget is that we do a installer training every two years for the on-site wastewater treatment systems installer. That is 100% reimbursed by the attendees, but we pay, we work with um, the, the Civic Center and the speakers and get them in, but the, there's a fee for the installers to attend, so it's basically reimbursed, so we're kind of basically a pass-through for that. Um, if you do look at the budget, there's it's about a $21,000 change um, the majority of that is because of that 30000 that isn't from this past year. And then also the installer training and then the 2.8% increase in the salaries and health insurance. Okay, any questions for Brittany?
Thank you for putting the, the grants in here, guys. I appreciate it. 319s and the grants that you have. In terms of the uh, floodplain management or whatever you call that, uh, to what extent is there collaboration, cooperation, or whatever between the city and the county in relation to floodplain management? Uh, speaking from my experience, I haven't really talked with the city at all concerning floodplain matters. Uh, Wes is a certified floodplain engineer. Uh, he may have some communication with the city, but I don't it's when it comes to those issues. Doesn't mean we can't. Um, I, I guess in my mind, uh, given the county and the, the configuration and everything, that, that uh, having a city one and a county one doing the same thing in some parts doesn't make much sense. But uh, it, maybe I'm looking at it wrong. It's a lot of work for one person to do. Well, I'm not saying one person, but, but entity. One in each, right. And that is part of the reason, from what I understand, that uh, West will not be uh, renewing the certification, as it was taking up a large amount of the time, and he wasn't being able to get done the items he was doing for highway, because he was and, spending a lot of time city on our floodplain permits. City floodplain, it doesn't do Inside county. city limits. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? I, I agree with, 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 with what you're saying. Uh, and I guess I'd like to know why Wes is, uh, other than and busy, you know, everybody's busy in, in, in life and, and, and whatnot, but if, if Wes is certified and, and that means some of his other duties going somewhere else, it's a matter of priorities and, and he's part of the county, so. And I also agree with you that, that this county probably ought to have one office doing floodplain management. And that might be something that we need to negotiate with the city with, whether it's us or them, or but one, one organization. So but I think before we launch off and on, on training, we probably ought to decide where we're, going to, where we're headed. Again, George, they have city and we're county. They don't track county floodplains, and maybe the state does, and we have a FEMA map, and we just use that. But we're talking about the, the individual's qualifications to do such. And you're and, saying if we need one. Well, I'm saying if, if there's people already trained, then, then we ought to be, rather than looking at training some more people, so it's going to be an expensive uh, situation, and we ought to look at what we currently have and expand upon that. The reason that Wes got his certification was to be a backup for Dan, because Dan was certified when he was here, and it was only meant, from my understanding, to be temporary. That in part answers that, but, but the chairman's question about a consolidated effort or a combined effort, I think is one that needs to be explored. It suggests to me, well, in, in this whole realm, uh, Planning and zoning, three mile limit, one mile limit, all that stuff uh, is much more complex than it needs to be. And um, whether it takes um, an effort by the commission and the city council to recognize that we're duplicating a lot of things or complicating a lot of things by, by not um, dealing with these things in a comprehensive way, uh, it's not not your fault or your your problem. It's uh, it's, it's it our problem. Yes, it's it's not theirs. It's our problem. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Anything else? Just the time frame on it. That if we were to do, try and work out something with the city, if that would be your direction, we really only have six months to get a, a working plan because if the certification for the county represented for the floodplain is not renewed, there would be nobody in the county to sign off on those permits. So we're using it yeah, for permits. I, 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 didn't, uh, I didn't bring that up to 
offset or, or do anything relative to the training. Yeah, same. Thing. Um, you know, having more than one person know something uh, is an advantage sometimes. And, um, you know, somebody that's already trained might join the Rainbow family and be gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And after training, we'll be much more knowledgeable when we do talk with the city to try and consolidate efforts. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Thank you. All right. Thank you. We're done for today. 9 a.m. in the morning. I think we should do. Is think about doing here? something different. Or? Retirement, the last planning committee. Like Denny's retirement. Sure. It, uh, that was it. Like in the future.